Okay, well, I'm uh, Peter Sharrick from SOAS. Um, SOAS has, for the past eight years, had a Southeast Asian um, art academic program, which has invited uh, 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 scholars from all over uh, Southeast Asia uh, to SOAS um, to do postgraduate degrees um, and research degrees. And uh, a, 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 a number of those in that program, uh, there are 100 altogether so far in eight years. Um, some of them are taking part in this webinar. Um, and uh, it's the first, first time we've done a, a, a program together on a subject which is, is known to specialists, but not uh, very widely in the world. But uh, Cambodia um, very clearly invented the world's first national health service. Now, this is a thing which concerns us all today uh, with COVID uh, in all our lives and families and institutions. Um, so the foresight in, in, in the 12th century of um, a Buddhist king called Jayavarman to invent the idea of a free for everyone health system, very systematically supplied, um, was an extraordinary one. And, and we, I think, all, all uh, feel um, that this should be better known. Um, and it's partly uh, the idea of Reti Chem, who is an old friend for many years, um, who's now, he's, he's been a professor in Toronto, he's worked in the uh, International um, Atomic Energy Association in, in uh, uh, agency in uh, Austria, and now he's back in Cambodia, working in uh, the prime minister's office and um, very much involved in archaeology of, uh, and, uh, of medicine in this 12th century um, uh, country. Um, so I will, f I will first um, introduce Rachel Harrison, who uh, is a professor of Southeast Asian studies in SOAS, and she, she is the chair of the Center for Southeast Asian Studies um, at present. So over to you, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I'll be very brief. I just wanted to say that it's a real pleasure um, to have this event as part of the, um, the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at SOAS kind of um, seminars and, and, and webinars program. And it's the first one of this calendar year. And I think it looks really superb and interesting and, and fits very closely with the kind of agenda that we have in the center, which is to do with fostering kind of interdisciplinary research and bringing, particularly bringing culture and medicine and history into dialogue with each other. So um, thanks very much, Peter, for putting this together. And thank you to all of you for, for being panelists and for the great number of attendees we've got. This is a really great start to the year for us. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Rachel. Um, could I now uh, briefly ask uh, Tinika Waters, um, who is in uh, Phnom Penh at the Putishastra University Medical Services Division, to uh, she will be co-hosting this session with me, um, just to say a few words. Yeah, uh, um, very warm greetings from Cambodia to all of the distinguished speakers, guests, and participants this evening. Um, as Peter said, I'm Dr. Tenika Water and I'm the Director of Research at the University of Sastra. And we feel very privileged to be co-hosting this with um, SOAS and the Centre for Southeast Asian Studies. Um, and just a little bit of background about our university. We're a large health science, private health science university in Phnom Penh with faculties of medicine, nursing, dentistry and pharmacy and with a really strong research public health focus as well as outreach into communities. Um, so to close this, um, my part of this, I think this webinar provides an excellent opportunity to look to the past 
and the wisdom from that and bring that and take that knowledge with us now into the future in particular public health and um, that expertise that comes through generations. So thank you very much to everybody for being here and I'm very looking forward to hearing our, our guests and our speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Tanaka. Yes, it is, it's not, it's quite unusual to have a group of people focused on archeology span and art history in the medieval world, connecting up with a live medical institution in the, in the, in the modern world. It makes a lot of sense. I, don't, I haven't seen it done very often. And, but where, where, this, where the two do combine is in Reti Chem, who is both an archeologist and um, a professional radiologist and is on the board indeed, of the Puti Shastra Hospital. So Reti will talk to us uh, shortly. Uh, I first want to uh, explain the format. We're using a format called, in my Japanese is not good, but uh, Pekka Kucha, which um, was invented by uh, Japanese architects who deal with a lot of detail and who want uh, to hold webinars which get the, the, the large ideas across. Uh, so the rules are no more than 20 slides and 30 seconds per slide. So it's a, it's a, it's a rapid way of getting key subjects there from real experts who have been obliged to boil everything down to uh, simple, uh, uh, graspable terms. Um, the first part, the first part um, of the webinar will be um, chaired by Meng Hong Chum, uh, who is uh, the Cambodian deputy director to UNESCO. Um, he, he was also on the SOAS program and he's a good friend of mine, um, but he is, um, he's, he's, I think uh, his Japanese is better than mine because he did a, um, a PhD in Japan. Um, but Meng Hong uh, is, is, the, uh, is the liaison person for, for a group of 40 um, alumni in Cambodia who are distributed through the ministries, the restoration organizations, the museums, the university. Um, so Meng Hong, I hand over to you if you would like to introduce yourself with a few words and you are then in charge of session one. Uh, th thank you so much, Peter. Uh, I would like to say thank you so much for your uh, kind uh, interest in seeing me. I, too, I would like to say uh, good morning and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like also express our thanks uh, for your participation today. Uh, and thank you so much for pro providing me uh, with this opportunity to share the first session of this conference. Actually, uh, my name is Chung Meng Hong. Uh, I'm a Deputy Secretary General of Cambodia National Commission for UNESCO. And I also representing the SOAS alumni in Cambodia. So uh, before starting this session, I would like to provide some rule, rule again for the speaker as well as uh, during the Q&A session. Uh, actually, our first section will focus on the 12th century Khmer Hospital Service. We will have uh, five speakers. Each speaker will have only uh, 10 minutes to present your own topics. If uh, you go over uh, 10 minutes, I will alert you and, and uh, I will give you one or two minutes more to finish your presentation. After uh, finishing five speaker, we will have 10 minutes for Q&A section. So you can drop your question in the chat box, Q&A chat box. Yeah, uh, let me remind again that uh, each question should be mentioned clearly to uh, which speaker that you wish to ask the question. So I would, look, I would like to start the first session of, of, of our conference. As the first speaker, I would like to invite High Excellency Dr. Uh, Reti Chaim, the President of History of Medicine in Southeast Asian and, uh, Society, 
to introduce a topic on the major Khmer 12th century medical care system. Uh, High Excellency, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, first of all, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Peter, my old friend, and uh, Tenike uh, from Putisasa, and certainly uh, my friends and colleagues from the Apsara Authority. Uh, just a small correction, I never taught at uh, University of Toronto, but I was professor at McGill University, and after that, chairman radiology nuclear medicine at Western Ontario in Canada. But so myself as a background, I represent uh, because uh, we have a gentleman from UNESCO. I'm a microcosm of UNESCO because I got an MD degree. I'm a medical doctor. I got a PhD in education and a PhD in history. So it's all started as a hobby, you know, living abroad. I visited Cambodia several times and met with archaeologists at Angkor. And one day, um, I, I decided that maybe I should turn this hobby into something more professional. And my initial thought was a method and how uh, to raise some historical hypothesis to guide the excavation of hospitals in Angkor because I'm a medical doctor, certainly interested in history of medicine and social history of Angkor. And at the same time, using archeological finds to inform my historical uh, question. So that's, that was the beginning. Uh, so I initiated actually the first uh, excavation ever of uh, Arugya Sala uh, Medical uh, of a Hospital at Angkor. The first one was done in 2006 at Pasar Tumung, and then followed much later uh, by uh, Tulis Mut. Uh, the first one was not very uh, informative from the perspective of, historical, uh, of a historian of medicine. But then in 2017, uh, the team of an archaeologist uh, uh, excavated Pasatul Ismut and currently ongoing Pasatap Rumkal. And they found a few uh, medicine uh, Buddha statues. It's not possible to talk about the history of medicine and public health anchor in 10 minutes, but I'd like to share with you uh, my findings uh, during my PhD research and the next 10 years up to now on my continued research as a sideline, as a hobby. But for those of you who are interested in my, in my research, uh, you can go to academia.edu, Google my name, and all the paper has been uploaded there. So what are the major findings? I, I, collect, I collected uh, seven points. Number one, the public health uh, of, uh, during Angkor, established by King Jaman VII, was actually a very successful system. The first one ever in the ancient world it was done by design and centralized and management by the imperial court, you know, under the blessing of a medicine Buddha as a, a very famous Buddha from the Mahayana Buddhism. And number two, the empire, the uh, Khmer Empire was under the protection of Buddha and the Pranyaparamita Sutra, the most important manuscript of Mahayana Buddhism and personified in the person of Queen Mother of King Jam Seven, and one of his wives, Queen Shraya Rajadevi. So Prajna Paramita Sutra is very important at the core of the belief and the protection of the empire at that time. If you look at number point number three, if you look at the gates at, at capital Angkor Thom, with Deva and Asura holding a huge dagger um, in view to protect the Prajna Paramita Sutra at the heart that is stored at the heart of the imperial capital on Kotom. I did, I published about that. And actually my interpretation, my argumentation is that this uh, statue were not part of the uh, turning of the ocean milk, which is a Hindu myth, uh, which is in a little bit in contrast with the, the, the reign during the reign of Jan Jayaman Seven, which uh, promoted Mahayana Buddhism at the highest level of the empire. Point number four, there's a network of uh, 102 hospitals that puzzled me for long years, but I did some research and my interpretation, not challenged uh, until now, uh, is that uh, these 102 are actually symbolic, symbolism of uh, religious uh, numbers, uh, probably because the Bisachaguru Mandala is made of 
51 divinity. And it is known historically, according to inscription, that German seven, every time he established a shrine uh, to his uh, uh, dedicated to uh, parents, he duplicated the number of, uh, of temples. And this made 51 by two with 102. That's my humble interpretation uh, a, and a challenge uh, a future historian to look into that. Uh, point number five, the hospital are under the blessing of Medicine Buddha named Blessed Chaguru and his two Bodhisattva. I have described uh, in detail the iconography which was unknown. It is known to scholars about the iconography of uh, Medicine Buddha in Tibet, in Central Asia, in China, uh, Burma, uh, Japan. Uh, right? But not known, not ever described in Cambodia. And I have described that according to inscription and mostly from comparative arts across the region. And finally, it took almost uh, 15 years uh, to find out to dig out those uh, uh, missing Buddha at the site of uh, Prasad is good that confirmed uh, the description, particularly the attributes in the hands of the Buddha. Point number six, I look at the practices of medicine and a medicine, a, a Buddhist medicine is a bit different from Ayurvedic medicine and particularly striking, two striking differences. Number one is a pulse taking. Pulse taking has been uh, seen as a bas relief at the Prasad uh, uh, Leonil in, in the east part of Angkor Thom. So the, if you go there, if you root, uh, read my paper, you will see the picture of those pulse taking. Uh, number two, uh, is the use of alchemy for uh, uh, you know the, the looking at uh, living eternally, and alchemy as uh, the practice of alchemy during that period has been supported by two set of evidences. Number one, inscription uh, uh, of uh, of Taprum. I think they mentioned uh, 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 mercury uh, sulfide uh, in in Sanskrit called hingula or hingulam, and also according to the account of the uh, Chinese. Uh, Visitor so that one in the 1296-297, he mentioned that he saw this red powder of a red uh, cinnabar on the market of Angkor. So those are the evidence for the practice of uh, um, of alchemy in uh, med Buddhist medicine at Angkor. And last uh, number seven is that medical knowledge are taught and sustained at monastic university, particularly the two largest one at Angkor. I have demonstrated according to inscription on stone and comparative uh, history that Taprum and Pakhan were actually Buddhist monastic university with residential college. And they have been built, uh, molded uh, according to the model from ancient India, namely the University of Nalanda and Vik Vikramashila. So this is in short, uh, the findings that I found. I am I'm pretty sure that in the future, we can find more evidence to support uh, uh, the findings that I have gathered over the last decade, working on this uh, famous hospital and the fantastic public health network that has been established in the 12th century by our great King Jayaman VII. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Kai uh, Sulintri, for your presentation. So, uh, I want to move to the next speakers. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Peter Sharok from Soash University to present uh, a topic about the Khmer Pesha Guru Trust and the medical herb gathering and the distribution role of the Vantage Temple. Professor, the floor is yours. That is slide one. Um, so the, the hospital network set up by this king, um, Arogya Shala, uh, Houses of Health, um, was built. There's no precedent for it in, in Cambodia. There was possibly something uh, in India under Ashoka, uh, but nothing as clear as this uh, uh, large uh, investment at the, in the opening years of the reign of Jayavarman VII. And it was fully 300 years before the first, before the, the nuns of Burgundy um, were financed by the local king to uh, open a house for the poor 
in Bonn, the Auspice de Bonn. Um, so it was a it was an unprecedented construction designed to help the people, and it was directed at all the people. All uh, people could enter the hospital, uh, the, the, the sites, and the inscription outside of each hospital gave, uh, said that the king was doing this because the suffering of the citizens was more, uh, was the greatest grief of a king. The significance of uh, the, the medical Buddha, the master of remedies by Shajaguru in this culture can be seen from this, uh, this map, this drawing, um, which shows the, the Bayon temple, which is a huge stone construction at the center of Angkor built by the king. This was the first Buddhist state temple in Cambodia. Um, earlier kings had built uh, large step temples to Shiva mostly, and uh, occasionally to Vishnu. And the, the map on the uh, left of the screen is of the central sanctuary of the Bayon temple. Um, and beside it is this uh, bright red, smaller sanctuary with the distinctive face towers, the size of a person, um, which is devoted by inscription to Baishadja Guru and the two uh, bodhisattvas, sunlight and moonlight, who were there to administer to the needs of people um, through the 24 hours. So it, it's, the only, uh, it's the only sanctuary which is so prominently placed next to uh, the central sanctuary of the kingdom. In Bantir Chma temple, which was, <coughs> which seems to have been called the second temple of King Jayavarman's empire, uh, which is close to the current uh, Thai border. Uh, I'll, show, I'll show a map shortly. Um, there is, a, there is a, a panel which shows the king in the right-hand corner, larger than everybody else in special ceremonial dress, making uh, an offering um, uh, in, uh, at a large gathering. And the focus of the, the event seems to be this, this pile of sacks down here. Um, my first thought was that this was the, uh, a tribute to the rice garden. There was an annual rice festival, which is noted in inscriptions. But I, having heard a lecture by Colin Millard in, in SOAS a few years ago, I changed my mind and I decided in fact that these were medicinal herbs and that um, the reason that linked Banti Chma to medicine is its proximity to the, the Dankrek mountains. Uh, that was the source of most of the herbs, also animals, animal parts were used, and there's the gold mine and various other things. So this, um, it, it seems to me that uh, the, we are seeing a special uh, royal ceremony, um, periodic, in Banti Chma to gather, to bless, and eventually to distribute um, the the medical herbs around the empire. Uh, Colin will give us a very close up idea of how this happens today in Tibet, um, the length of the ceremony, because it, to get the lapis lazuli light into the medicine required the chanting and uh, medita medita meditative efforts of the monks. It took a long time. So the king's strategy, uh, he was brought up as a fighting prince, fighting actually in neighboring Champa. Um, but he developed his unique mix of humanitarian and military um, mode of ruling. This was a highly literate society. There were many books and texts, but only the ones, and Angkor was not the capital after the 15th century, 
So many of the written texts were destroyed. The writing that we have to go on, the epigraphy, there are still uh, 1,500 inscriptions, but they're indicted into stone on temple walls. Um, so it's the, we don't have the luxury of libraries of texts um, as there are in China and Japan, for instance. Um, here is a, a quick picture of Bhante Ichma on the Thai border um, and a, some of the 30 hospital sites all built on the same plan. They're quite distinctive plans um, in what is now Isan, Northeast Thailand. And uh, most probably Bhante Ichma had a role of administering this large number of hospitals just across the mountains um, in what is now Northeast Thailand. The model, the, the, here's a model, a 3D model by uh, Olivier Kuna of exactly what was involved. There was a pond outside the main building. There was a sanctuary with the Buddha here in, in uh, erected um, and wooden buildings would have been surrounded, all of which have disappeared. disappeared. The Cambodians were known for their skill in, in medicinal herbs. In the seventh century, um, an Indian tantric sage, sage Ponyodaya, went to China um, and was sent by the emperor to Cambodia to uh, acquire this expertise and indeed bring back some of the magical herbs that they'd heard were uh, most efficacious. Um, he was so loved by the Cambodians, Ponyodaya, that um, there is a record of a Buddhist delegation from uh, Cambodia going to Chang'an. This is the only record we have of um, uh, a seventh century uh, Khmer group going to China um, to plea for his return. And the emperor agreed and he went back and spent the rest of his days in Cambodia. Um, here are, on, on the hospital in uh, Stella, uh, we get some detail of the uh, products that were used in, meds, in the medical mix. And it, it notes also that the most precious ones would, would, would be delivered three times a year from the king's own warehouse. This was the most potent um, in for instance, the royal touch um, was said to be uh, a special power of kings in Europe. Um, people would simply be touched by a king and would be cured. Well, there's something similar about the king uh, sending a personal donation to 102 hospitals. This is what the hospitals look like. This is Pimai in Northeast Thailand, looking at the city, the old city wall, and outside of the city wall is the sanctuary of the hospital. So it was a large laterite, mostly laterite building. Uh, there, there are two others here. Um, and it was set outside the city for, uh, for the quiet um, and, and so on, and social distancing of people who were ill. Uh, in, in this case, we have um, a, a Vishnu temple built by Surivaman II, who was Vaishnava. And uh, we can see here Vishnu on Garuda. Uh, and opposite it, so supporting and combining with Vishnu, which was typical of the Khmer religion, was a hospital um, built by Jayavarman VII. And here was the medical Buddha holding a Vajra and a Ganta. And these pedestals for the, for the icons are typical of these sites. Here, it, here are some of the, the major icons that were found by uh, Thai archaeologists, and each time it's this uh, royal Buddha figure holding a Vajra and a Ganta to the diaphragm. More of them are being excavated all the time, coming out of the ground. Now, the identity 
of the Khmer by Shadja Guru was, was, um, was fixed quite recently by Hiram Woodward of the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore. He saw this bronze in a dealer's uh, sh exhibition in New York. It, the bronzes are attached. The base is all one. They're not put on, on, on top. They're welded together. And he then realized that that was the triad that he'd been looking for to fit into all the hospitals in Northeast Thailand. And here we have, therefore, the Khmer Baishaja Guru and the two bodhisattvas holding um, cylinders, probably for medicine, possibly for mercury, and so on. And I just noticed that uh, Feng Dada will, uh, when he looks at uh, the current excavation in, in, in uh, Siem Reap, that he has indeed a pedestal with three slots for the Buddhas. This is um, a, a short quotation, uh, I'll, which I'll, I'll leave you to read, that the, we are going to record it um, from, from the... There's no, I can't find a go back button. Is, is the one, Charles? Yes, if you press the, the left arrow key on the keyboard, that should take you back. Oh, sorry. No. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. Um, so homage to the Buddha in, in the various forms. Um, uh, Homage to Baishaji Guru, um, sunlight, moonlight, and uh, so this raised by this king, um, and the four castes, there weren't really castes in Cambodia, but it's, it's picking it up from Sanskrit, uh, were cared for here. There are two doctors, uh, each one a man, and two women in residence. This is the positioning of hospitals outside Angkor Thom. So the Bayon is at the center, um, north, south, east, and west, and, and Feng Dara will show us the one at the bottom in the south. Um, so again, strategic position outside the center of the city, um, like the ones in Northeast Thailand. This is the one on the east. This, uh, this, uh, by Guru has now been removed to the conservation. Um, the pedestal is left there. That is not, it's only been uh, partially restored. And this yes, is sorry. which is- yes, sorry, sorry to interrupt. We uh, run our time. We, you have uh, two minutes more to, to okay, fine. write your presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, Im Sokriti, who's going to talk to us soon, he, um, identified this hospital format in Banti Echmar. Slightly larger um, construction, but basically on, with the same pattern with a, a pond outside. And the largest icons of the Buddha, this one is in, in the uh, Phnom Penh Museum. These two are in private collections, also came from Banti Echmar, which seems to reinforce the notion that this was a very important medical center. So there's the, uh, the Bhashaja Guru of Bhanti Echma, and there are the, the circle of hospitals. So I, I will end it there. Uh, the, it, was, it, was, it remains to be, what, what we have little evidence of is exactly how uh, the herbs were treated and distributed, but we can look at what happened in Tibet to give us an idea of it. So thank you. Uh, do you finish with your presentation? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you so much for uh, uh, your presentation. I would like to move to the next speaker. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Msorati from Asra Authority to present a topic about hospital and the uh, Royal Road to Kimai. Uh, the floor is yours. Um, thank you. Uh, um, firstly, I would like to share my screen for going to detail uh, uh, in my presentation. Um, 
Okay. Um, you see on the screen, this is uh, on the left picture of the activity, probably in the hospital. And that sculpture has been sold on the Bayon, uh, the southern, the, the, the inner uh, Balif uh, gallery of Bayon Temple. Um, the only one speaker may left to show us so what going on, what happening uh, inside you know, the hospital. And you see the structures was within wood with roof tie and you know a lot of decoration and many people working uh, in active of the medical checkup treatment, giving uh, uh, drug, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So um, let me first uh, give you an idea on the projects that uh, you know uh, Thai and Cambodia is working on for more than ten years ago. The project is called, uh, you know, a Living Angkor Road project. The, you know, Khmer Thai cooperation on the research, uh, architectural research on the road. And the project was supported by Thailand Research Funds, uh, Chola Rong Plai Rojal Military Academy, Silipapa University, Fire Department, and in Cambodia, uh, Upscale Society, which was started in, uh, you know, uh, 2005. And this is a, a cross-border, actually, a multi reduced multidisciplinary research aimed firstly to identify all the remain portions of the ancient road, uh, radiating from the Angkor capital to different provinces and neighboring country of the Khmer Empire, uh, in view of overall mapping the network known to them. And secondly, we want to identify and describe all the infrastructure existing along this road, such as uh, bridges, all kinds of canal, temple, building of rest house, hospital, etc. etc. And then thirdly is to study the lives of the people who live in the long road nowadays in terms of you know ancient community, or no, about the Kony community, ancient industry and the continuous culture and the way of life, people who are living uh, along the road until now too. Um, for the studies we have been, you know, as I said, utilizing uh, the multi approach. And the team benefits uh, you know, from the result of the remote sensing survey, which is uh, certainly have to systematic ground testing conducting during the survey campaign you know, in Cambodia, Thailand, as well as in Laos, Pido. Uh, a number of sites were excavated and the excavation was done, with, you know, according to the modern uh, method using the geo-informative, geo etc. for reduce the, you know, the destruction, destruction of the, you know, size. Uh, later on, we, you know, expanded uh, our study to identify, to identify the cultural relationship in the regional scale from the ancient communication network based on our studies having, that has been, you know, um, the work has been last for more than 15 years. Um, you know, the other works we, uh, on the ancient road, there's a multi dimensional aspects of the road, you know, uh, the road used as intercity or and state road or route uh, lies, you know, a golden network if you see later on, and also the road inside the city, local use, you know, a special purpose of road, and multi temporal uses of road, you know, like the road used through town and then finish and then rebuild and, 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 you know, expand through the town. And then this is the our results of the work for almost you know 15 years. We map it, you know, we, we have we map the uh, road network. Uh, you know, the the road uh, the road was recorded in, in uh, Prakan inscription, tracing this uh, name as Atria. So this is Atria, you no know, Bretnal and no other part of name. This is Mendo and now they ask me live before Royal Road. So you see there, you know, a big number, a, a long, a very long uh, network uh, linked from the capital city on go inland and 
you know, linked to the every region of every regions of the empire, and one on the eastern part maybe to the South China Seas, and another one to the west part, probably to link to the Araman Sea to the seaport, the capital inland, but in the empire open to the world, to the maritime trade route, and connect you know, from the seaport to the capital city by the land road. And then this is the case that we studied, that, that we uh, you know, see today, though, about Uncle Pimai Road. And you know, on the left screen, you see this is the uh, you know the zoning of our study, so four kilometer, uh, you know uh, that we did. Uh, all the structure remain has been mapped from the Onko uh, capital to Pimai, and then uh, on the right hand side, the map that you see the you know um, the rest house uh, has been recorded in the stone Gibson or Pekan. Uh, 17 has been number in the inscription, and by the archaeological field work, the whole number of 17 has been found. And then you see all this uh, location of the rest house, and among them, you will see letter relating to the hospital. And so you know, we develop, you know, like we call geospatial development. So we use some, you know, modern technologies. Now that we need to see all the portion of road and archaeological feature has been sold to, you know, from sky view, uh, sea line, similar, you know, to what we see uh, Great Wall of China, as well. And then this is. Uh, we also put on the data in the Google Earth, and you see this is the, you know, the view from the uh, Pimai, from the Korat Plateau down to Angkor. You see, uh, the 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 on uh, on the base. You see, this is all the section on the Pimai, and then the road run down through Dongrai and reach to capital city, capital city Angkor on the. Southeast and Pimai was located in northwest of Angkor. And this is view, this is a view uh, you know, on, of the road uh, Angkor Pimai from Angkor. And then we, we did a lot of you know inventory and we uh, put in the database of the um, thousand of the uh, aggregate sites along the road from Angkor until Pimai. So the length of the road, roughly about you know, 250 uh, kilometer long. And then uh, about hospital, um, we identified um, you know, eight hospitals along the Uncle Tupi Mines, and four uh, remain on, you know, on the road from Uncle to Dongre, and another four from Dongrek to be my mountain Dongrek. And it's feature of the, you know, the image of the uh, hospital. And the right hand uh, side, you see uh, the hospital view from, you know, uh, helicopter. So the outreach system, um, you know, uh, on the road. So one, so from one to other hospital, they are 40 kilometer, roughly, probably 40 kilometer. So, if you walk, it takes about three hours. We can reach to one hospital. Or you riding on Oscar, you will take two hours and a half. And if you're riding on elephant, or on ele elephant, so you take uh, two hours. And one uh, and if you're riding on horses, more most uh, is uh, faster than so you can use uh, about one and a half uh, hour. You can reach to one hospital. So, and then you see in Angkor, um, yeah, we start from the beginning. Um, Angkor, this is the, the central part of capital city of Angkor. So, Peter saw you only four hospitals on the, you know, each gate of the Angkor Tom. But actually, we 
there are six hospital, uh, you know, recently found in Angkor. So there are two, uh, the one on the main road for Angkor to be mine is starting from the west gate of Angkor Thom, and we pass through, you know, to the dive of the Barai, and we should walk up north a little bit, and we 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 will meet with one hospital just on right hand side. This is the the now they call Prasad Pre uh, Prasad or Panchon Toun. This is the first hospital before we leave on go to Pimai. And then the another one, you know, one hospital on the northern part of uh, uh, Wall, northern wall of Pekan, Pasad Ray. You know, uh, Prakhan keeps on mentioning about what is about one hospital uh, uh, in the city of Sri, uh, you know, Zaya uh, Sri, uh, but actually uh, the, term, the, the hospital not was not located inside the Prakhan, but just immediately north of the uh, Pasad Prakhan. It called now the Pasad Prey. So the total uh, hospital found in capital city of Angkor were six, six together. And then this is, I give you the map of the location of the hospital found along the road from Angkor to Pimai. You see all the eight just end at Pukurisi, they on the gate into the Pimai. And then there are another two further north, one Prang Kosong Prams, and then another one in Prang Pu, was in now they in Chayapu. And you see all another two exactly on alignment on the road on go to Pimai. So you may you know understand that this is uh, no, 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 this is the road which is not just end at Pimai. It most probably can use up north no, to Chayapum. You see, because you know, two hospital on the alignment to the north. And then Ibn Kishma uh, Peter mentioned. So we we identified four, you know, that Ibn Kishma, there are actually eight satellite temples. And there are four located inside the, you know, uh, the wall of the city and the other remain outside. So the one who closer the, the boat of the Benkechma, you see here on the north and on the west and on the south and on the east, all the four, you know, was uh, hospital. And it was very special one, uh, in, not in terms of the, you know, the sign, but also the tower, ground with faces. This is something special that we never found elsewhere, but in city of Pantichma. And then uh, some idea to give you about, you know, recently work at Koke. So normally we found only one process allowed uh, as hospital, but last October, 2021, myself and the team, we identify another one. Uh, so here, the number one up north, this is just on nearby the road, you know, link from Koke to the Royal Road, from Uncle to uh, Watu. Huh? So this is one and another one here. So two uh, was, you know, built in the, uh, you know, uh, capital cities of Tokke early 10th century. And then it show you that um, the 10th century capital abundant, but there are people still living and then Jayawarman 7 back on the side and build another two hospitals in the city. And then this is the, what Peter saw also, uh, you know, this is uh, our colleague, Dr. Sora, 
uh, my my co uh, uh, project uh, director of the Living Goro project did you know all the hospital found in Thailand side uh, see all the dots and then he conduct uh, you know a research on the you know, communi communication link between one hospital to other so what we call the the community Arokasala community because you know, the, uh, hospital always have in the city uh, uh, downtown so you see the next so the connection uh, the link between one to other hospital uh, the upper network in uh, northern Thailand uh, not there. and then in Cambodia I'm, side, I'm sorry Bong uh, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt so, you with uh, 15 minutes now. You have two minutes more to sum up your presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, okay. We'll be, we'll be in one minute. So, see, so probably so this is showing the, um, the map about in Cambodia side, the uh, temple uh, of the uh, hospital. And then so all the, you know, uh, uh, location of the hospital has been put in one map. And you see mostly that uh, on the northeast Thailand, northern uh, part of the, you know, uh, uh, Lesap, but uh, we have not chance yet to do more research, you know, on the south on the southern part of the Lesap Lake, and then on the, you know, along the Mekong River. Uh, this is the the two region that we did not uh, finish, and then we found another one in the foothill of Bajongko. Uh, you know, next to the, you know, to uh, Southern Vietnam. Uh, for the sunrise, so up to date, 64 uh, hospitals among 102 has been identified. 32 found in Thailand, more to update, and probably two in Laos, PDO, and 30 in Britain, Cambodia. And I list all the, you know, uh, location here in the slides. So this is finished from mine. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Bongati, for your presentation. I would like to move to the next speakers. I would like to invite uh, Mr. Peng Dara uh, from Absara Authority to present a topic about the new hospital excavation in Angkor. Dara, the floor is yours. Uh, good, every, uh, good evening. Uh, good evening, everyone. So my name is Peng Dara. Uh, today is present. I would like to talk about the Taprumkal Temple, new hospital excavation in Ongko. This present will focus on the evidence of the archaeological excavation at the foundation system of the three structural uh, building at Taprum, Taprum complaint. So this talk will be divided to four main uh, important points. Firstly, I am going to provide the various bridge, the history background of Taprum Temple. Secondly, I am going to explain about the purpose of the archaeological research excavation at the foundation system of the three architectural buildings of Taprumkal complex. And uh, I also will explain about the, the primary uh, results from excavation. In addition, I will present uh, the plan in the future and uh, the purpose of the archaeological research excavation around the Taprum Temple. And finally, I'm going to propose the, the primary conclusion in this excavation. Let me to start the first part of the history background of the Taprum Temple. Taprum Temple. Taprum Temple is located at the northwest part of the famous Angkor Wat Temple. This temple is one of the four uh, the hospital out of the Angkor Thom in Angkor region and among of the 102 
hospital throughout the Khmer Empire. The Prumka Temple is was built in the reign of the King Taiwan Seven during the late 12th century and decade of the, uh, the Mahayana Buddhism. During the 1920s, this temple was cleaned and studied and preserved by the Hungry Maksar. Based on the three holes and the key story man at this temple, it clearly presents the three men Buddhist god, the three yard, such as the Peji Guru, Peji Guru at the center, and flock by the two Buddhist sattva, uh, Chan, Chan Vajero, at the left hand, and Surya uh, Chan Vajero, at the right hand. So it is clearly that uh, this Buddha so this temp Tapram temple is the chapel, chapel, chapel hospital. Move on to the next point, the purpose of archaeological research at the Tapram temple. Currently, the Tapram temple is cut so collapsed at the southwest corner and the cut Parcel damage at the roof at the basement. In order to enhance the history value of the temple and its surrounding context, the Atra Authority has proposed a restore conservation project of this temple. Along with this recent project, archaeological research excavation also includes it is the first important to process before conducting conservation intervention. The purpose of uh, the archaeological research is record interior uh, architectural structure and the complex. The first important phase of the excavation to discover of the foundation system of the main tower, preparing this tower to stabilize and maintain to be sustainable structural and around the structural arrangement such as library and uh, it, the first entrance gate. This equation trend uh, open at the uh, noise part of the temple. This trend is to study the relationship between the first gate and the pond. This trend is 12.30 meters long and wide 1.50 meters. According to the static traffic course analysis of this trend, the main thread that there are six uh, stages of the contraction between the first gate and the pond. So the first gate, there's the soil to make the pond. And then see, and then second stage took the soil from the pond to prepare the ground height to make the foundation of uh, the first gate, which is this, the first stage. Then the fourth stage is the occup occupation phase where the first gate and the pavement of lateral debris were contracted. The fifth stage was built in lateral staircase around the pond. Around the pond. Finally, uh, the sixth stage is abandoned, abandoned layer. Each strand were found a root tie fragment block that probably the root tie of the first gate because of the roof of this gate can be made of the wooden. Uh, the equation of this strand at the southwest of the central tower that has uh, 13 meter long and 1.15 meter wide. The purpose of this equation, this strand, is to study the relationship between the library and the first wall of the south. According to the stratigraphy of this strand, it shows that there are six states 
to the synth to relate between the library and the first wall in the south. So the first stage they fill the ground high and then the, and then the second stage they dig a pit 1.44 meter deep to make the foundation of the first wall and library as well. This foundation pit filled by very fine of layer red sand and rich stone that make uh, foundation is very strong condition. Then the, the third state, they made the first wall and library building. However, the fourth state is like the lateral structure building that probably corridor in front of the central tower. This building consists of the light, consists of the, the lateral floor with the sandstone debris foundation. The fifth state is the, the fifth state is the uh, occupation phase, but this state we found the block of the root of the root high fragment and a few clamp that used for connect from the sandstone to another stone. Uh, so this strand, we, we found an appreciative tool inside the library that tool probably brushes brush the medicine. Similar to the function of this tool, there is another small body relief uh, at the super basement of this Taprumka temple, which show the two people can be, can be hitting uh, medicine with uh, Motor and pistol. Because of this, another two two people on the right hand side with a a person helping to lift to left the another a person who may sit. But this image in the middle want to show the person who had left it to ask for the medicine from the person who hit the medicine, thinking that there was something in hand as a medicine. However, we think that uh, here the store using uh, the ritual fire because some researcher actually that the library is a place for the fire ceremony because of the south is, is the direction of the, of the fire god of acne. But uh, it also seemed to be pleasing. This strand contains small fragment of the sculpture that we might think were probably acne god. Because of the acne god upright on it, knee with the right hand holding the object on top. On another hand, this uh, sitting god fragment seem look like the nine planet Navagraha sitting, sitting because of the location of this library, uh, uh, library, library place is the nine planet in my art. The excavation this strand is the west of the temple is uh, eight meter long and one point one point fifty meter wide. The purpose the purpose of this is the purpose of this strand is to that study with the weakness of the foundation of the main tower. In the first stage, they did they did a large strand with a deep of 2.47 meter to put fine to put the fine sand with stone to support the main tower. And then the second stage, this second stage is the lateral floor uh, of this main tower. And the third stage is another uh, lateral building, lateral building. And the fourth state is the abandoned state, state of the temple. This, 
uh, this trend we found the sub direction of the of a, a ritual uh, uh, pedestal at the southwest at the southwest and ahead of the urban ware at the end of the root type. Uh, we are planning another phase that excavation will be extended to surrounding feature the temple to see the important general organization of the whole uh, of the whole whole hospital compound. Uh, there are four men and two digital plan in the future. The first important arm is to discover the general architectural plan rank of the temple complex as there are no exact plan has been con conducted. Secondly, the study around the temple complex and its related relationship with human habitat in the beginning of the 12th century and the end of the 12th century. Because of the location of Taprum the Pearl Temple that built in the late 12th century, is it in front of the Angkor Wat Temple that built in the early 12th century? How do these two era will communicate uh, together? Certainly, find out the important activity of the hospital such as treatment facility, medical equipment, type of traditional medicine, and especially the man got for sacrifice in this uh, temple. Finally, the main aim of this research is to enhance the hospital value of the Taprum Temple and the the ancient hospital to the Cambodian people to understand about the health service and the medical production in the ancient times. In the conclusion, as the result of the about archaeological uh, investigation, so the construction process of the Taprum Kel Temple. This is clear that Taprum temple was contracted on the compact soil as in the general Khmer uh, ancient temple was built in the on the artificial, artificial layer. It is also that the foundation of the first gate of the foundation of the wall and the library are still strong enough to support the superstructure. However, the foundation of the M tower has lost its capacity strength to support the uh, superstructure. This, this uh, we know Minan has been forced more, more movement of the temple and uh, foundation subsidy, which caused southwest part of the temple collapse. On another hand, the recently discovery of the archaeological uh, item has shown about this unimportant data to be to be fulfilled to the previous research data that has not existed before, and also a good data for further research related to the Chapel Hospital. Or moreover, the future expansion of the research at the Taprum Temple is understanding the structure around the around the temp, around uh, around the temple to be a model for another uh, another hospital in the reign of the Jayaman Seven. Okay, thank you for your attention. So much uh, thank you so much, Dara, for your presentation. So uh, next, I would like to invite uh, uh, Kalatini 
uh, from Singapore to present a topic Bye. about the least good uh, uh, hospital site at Uncle. The floor is yours. Let me know if you can hear me okay. Yeah, yes, I can hear you properly. Tom. Okay, I'm going to start the screen share, but I have to wait for the other screen to turn off. There we go. And voila. Welcome, everyone. Shemri Apsua, Socks by Day. And hopefully you can see it. Is my screen being shared? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see your screen. Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you very much. I'd like to, uh, without thanking everyone, because that would take an hour and a half, uh, I'll just give a, a, some special thanks to Dr. Ed Darrett and Dr. Carolee Belanyeshi, among many others, including Huan Yao, who Peter had the privilege of mentoring just uh, fairly recently. He finished his graduate work at SOAS. And uh, Sing Sopin and numerous others for this uh, project at Tolong Sanat. And this was part of a, our international field school. And uh, we ran out of the Londa Shri Vijaya Center with, uh, with uh, Opsara and numerous other institutions, uh, including the FEO and the Australians, Americans, and everybody under the sun had, had assisted. And that was a lot of fun and very productive. And so the archaeology was one of the main aspects. And we chose the hospital site after, uh, because of its you know, urbanization and a lot of other factors. I won't go into detail here. So uh, implementation, uh, excellent work. What it was, was it was a research and international training endeavor. And so there was a, a, a critical members of the project had several different important research questions to address through this hospital research. Now, excellent work has been done on hospitals and Tony Scott in the past. Although the primary emphasis has consistently been on the historical, epigraphic, architectural, and art historical aspects, especially the, the, you know, uh, the chapels, the temples themselves are impressive. There has been modern archeological, hydrological, and geological research focused on site formation, settlement, site use, including ossuaries and infrastructure and occupation sequences. And this includes Opsara FEO efforts uh, with Christophe Poitier, the Greater Encore Project, uh, which was an excellent project, including Tolang Sangat. They just missed the statuary, but they found the post holes uh, supporting the bridge, uh, which uh, Reti reconfirmed uh, uh, in, in his uh, trenches and excavations at Tolang Sangat, uh, going over one of the canals next to the road, which, uh, of course, Tolang Sangat is at the northern outside end of the gate, at that northern gate. So, uh, and there's a lot, considerable amount of Thai and Lao research, which Riti had, had talked about, and so forth. And this is in the site references, and Peter Sherrick's work on this article on the right here, you'll see 2011, is excellent. Uh, so it's an outstanding piece, and he goes into the details of the Surya, Chandra, Virakana, but medicines, healthcare, state, you know, and uh, the, the king's support, recipes, plants, and, and uh, staffing and a lot of other things in detail. Also, Hunter Watson uh, has studied and I think continues to study epigraphy uh, and uh, particularly the hospital sites as well. I'm anxious to see what he's published recently. So the site report is available publicly and that's the one on the left here and you can download that if you haven't already. So there's a consistent pattern, as Ritty noted, and others uh, to hospitals and locations, but there is some variability uh, in local variability and layout and elements, but they all tend to have a chapel, a formal pond, which is probably medicinal uh, in many aspects, uh, and, and, but not necessarily the only pond there. Uh, entryway and gates, walkways, walls, and libraries, of course. Um, and they don't have, according to Hunter, necessarily consistent staff numbers. So these vary from, from inscription to inscription, hospital to hospital. Uh, the recovery, and here's another layout of some of the pat patterns. You see there is a consistent pattern, but there is some variability within that normal template. Um, and they're laid out, as Ritty discussed, in a consistent pattern. There's a reason for this. <clears throat> And this shows the Greater Encore Project's uh, zones of, of surface sampling. And the pottery we recovered is very much like the pottery they identified. A lot of it ranging from the Encorean period, especially, you know, that uh, 10th, 11th, 12th, and 13th century, especially exotic wares in about the same, you know, uh, proportions, you know, so a lot of uh, uh, Khmer local wear, you know, the stoneware and 
the earthenware, and then uh, a lot of exotic, uh, especially Chinese representation uh, with kind of 12th, 13th century pottery is expected Ching Pai covered boxes and so forth and so on. Uh, not so much blue and white, but there is some, um, and a lot of celadon. And then, um, so the recovery of statuary in such good condition, uh, especially the Dvar Apala, which you saw on the opening slide, and this, uh, the Baisaji Guru, uh, which the upper portion was missing, but this, uh, this complete Surya or Chandra by Rakana, uh, with the moon and the sunlight, uh, bodhisattvas, the artifacts, ecofacts, and other information was surprisingly good. And so it was kind of remarkable that they were in such good condition they were still there, uh, especially the statuary given the fragile nature of the existing architecture because the, the, uh, the temple itself, the, the chapel is in, in very fragile condition. And, and fortunately, Apsara and other teams have stabilized that and they're doing good work on that. The fact that these statues were still there uh, and not necessarily uh, taken by museums because uh, they were just barely under the surface and uh, or stolen was quite remarkable. And so looting is a huge problem, as we all know, in Cambodia. So uh, that they weren't removed as part of even abandonment, which is not unusual that they would have been left there in the transition afterwards. But the fact that they weren't collected or, or stolen in subsequent antiquity or even modern times is, is kind of remarkable. However, despite all these great uh, statues of uh, giant, you know, uh, two meter Dvarapala and these, uh, these other nice uh, Buddha and Bodhisattva statues, uh, one of the most unique artifacts was uh, this elephant in the round as far as carvings. Uh, and that was, that's, in my opinion, one of the most interesting and unique pieces there. Um, I'll move on to this. Like I said, some of this uh, exotic and local pottery is expected in the settlement. The fact that it doesn't have a deeper time depth is kind of interesting, but if you compare it to excavations on Uncle Wat and elsewhere, not that unusual. If you compare it to a city like Koke, Koker, uh, which has a much more extensive time depth, at least the sixth, seventh century, and then on into really the 15th, 16th, 17th century of continual occupation use, this is kind of unusual that it's this kind of uh, fragment of the time period. And perhaps we didn't dig deep enough, or perhaps the site was cleared before it was built, or perhaps it was just marginally used for agricultural lands before they put in the road, the canal and the gates, which would have you know, stimulated some uh, more urbanization and occupation and higher density trafficking and settlement. And again, this is some of the local wares expected and usually indicative of habitation and normative daily use. And here's some of the exotic ware, typically Chinese, you know, Ching Pai, the Celadons, and this is a similar pattern we see throughout the country during similar time periods. And of course, this is one of the most fascinating pieces, in my opinion, from the whole excavation. And you can see uh, to the left and lower, that's the trunk of the elephant head. And then the center is the elephant head looking to its right and on our left. And it's just unusual. I have no explanation for it. Uh, but it's not the only elephant I've seen you know, going out to Summer Brink Cook and other sites where you take a stone or a boulder in the round and it's carved into an elephant, not necessarily uh, a deity uh, such as Ganesh, but uh, just an elephant. <clears throat> now, of course, uh, let me move on before I get too caught up in that because we're low on time. Uh, like I said, there wasn't clear evidence of earlier occupation. There is clear evidence of contemporary site use and occupation well beyond the main chapel, however. So this is the kind of awkward Tom area. And here's where one of the hospitals is. And we do, here's another LIDAR view of it. You know, the larger picture in its location. It was Encore Wat, Encore Tom. Here's the hospital and other hospitals, all six of them now at these uh, strategic points. And we do have, uh, and here's the area we tested. And you see this kind of moat mound depression gridded area. And that's probably in antiquity it was developed. So I don't think it's necessarily modern development. But you see these depressions are ponds, and you have the more formal pond up front, right next to the chapel. 
And that's lined and laterite and, and sandstone and things like that. So it would have been more formalized and perhaps ritual, but also probably involved in the healing and medical treatment practices. But also the similar remote mound pattern that you have in urban areas, you know, beginning at least uh, in the pre-Encorean period, and perhaps earlier. And certainly we see that pattern in Angkor and Kake and in other urban areas throughout Cambodia. And that's been well highlighted with the LIDAR research and various people working on that. And it's right next to, of course, the canal and the road network. And there was a bridge uh, over here connecting it. So it's part of the infrastructure. Hospitals are an integral part of infrastructure like universities and like administrative buildings and military compounds and so forth. So the metal remains that we know that earlier, and you saw just a uh, rusted fragment, it's, it's kind of uh, quick to jump to conclusions. And, uh, and we'd like to say, yeah, these are medical implements, but highly unlikely, they're probably part of the architectural features. And they're heavily oxidated. And if there were medical implements that we've recovered, they, they, that would be highly unlikely because these things are important things and would have been likely taken away by the doctors after site disuse. <clears throat> And uh, we got to be careful with the exotic remains, uh, such as the pottery, you know, the Chinese uh, Qing Pai covered boxes, because they weren't as valuable back then in a sense that we placed uh, an art history value or an art collector value on it today. But they would have been important for sure, but the contents such as the nutmeg would have been uh, far more important. The potential for other statuary at the site is extremely high, considering we just tested a small area and recovered so much statuary. So it is likely that there are plenty more out there and hopefully uh, they're not being targeted for theft. And Officer has done a good, uh, good job uh, protecting that zone. And so have the locals, so that's commendable. And one other thing, like I said, nothing's re that remarkable in a sense. It's remarkable that it's in good condition. It's still there as far as that. Now, it would be nice to have results of any residue analysis conducted on the pottery because maybe we can identify specific plants or at least uh, genera of plants, uh, such as in containers or pollen and phytolith if they're growing medicinal gardens analysis from soil samples. And those samples still exist and they're all stored with obsoracin. The potential is there. We planned this, but NSC had dissolved, unfortunately, and moved on to Indonesia, and then COVID hit. And so, hopefully, someone will take on that that uh, that research in the future. So, as far as medical industries go, uh, the bigger picture. Uh, when we view the inclusion of kind of formalized hospitals, healthcare staff, supplies, and related training and education, Jai Varman 7's master plan, right? This is intensive state investment into urban and infrastructural development and construction at a scale far greater than anything before. Hospitals and healthcare become a pragmatic, sensible, and natural part of the planning and implementation process, right? So the hospitals were also probably just a small fraction in percentage of everything that was launched by Jai of Arm VII. So we're talking of all the infrastructure development, roads, rest houses, uh, universities, the temples, urbanization, canals, and everything. The hospitals become a natural part of that whole plan and also a smaller percentage a reasonable percentage, and there's a, there's a lot of logic to that. So in that, I mean, roads, bridges, canals, reservoirs, sewage, and some of these mysterious concentric uh, circles like it, it, Angkor Wat that show up on LIDAR that are still unexplainable. One of my uh, sewage engineer friends, he's an engineer with wastewater management, thinks it's a sewage treatment, treatment facility. Um, so buildings, education, hospitals, and that light, the plan put more people to work, kept them healthier, facilitated a modernized value chain infrastructure, able to handle more volume and capacity to also include increased security and security force deployment, logistics and transportation being key factors of military capacity, effectiveness and healthcare as well. So the importance for a healthier, better functioning, more effective and efficient labor force, population in general, 
supply value chain, logistics, and communication network is pragmatically logical. Thus, the layout of the hospitals along major road networks, population centers, fixed and fluid, and major urban areas, including the capital, including placement near and outside the entry points at the gates, right? It makes sense. It was not just a cosmological, spiritual, favoritism-based, self-glorifying, or arbitrary decision-making and planning and execution effort. Jive Armin VII was a military strategist, and he had a lot of practical experience with different cultures and movement and stuff like that. He was a military commander, a strategist, and a state leader, a diplomat with political and economic experience. He had numerous embedded campaigns and life experiences to enhance his cross-cultural competencies. He was a pragmatic learner and scholar with an educated background, formal and experiential, and a presumably practicing Mahayana Buddhist. Begs the question and purpose of his conversion. I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to interrupt, Kamiran. Yeah. Now, Kamiran, you had two minute notes. Yeah, I'm just about done. So anyway, uh, there's a lot of reasons why all this makes sense. Um, and just two key points before I close, it's not sure how quiet these hospitals were in their locations, because they certainly seem to have been in, uh, in congestion points or popular points and uh, certainly inhabited in, in population centers. Also urban areas along these communication roads, there's a strategy for that. And also entry points on gates, which were busy. They weren't necessarily quiet. Now the yard itself outside the you know, medical uh, treatment areas might have been quiet, but certainly not the overall settlement. Uh, although uh, Encore is known for its low density uh, dispersed uh, urban nature in general. So one of the most curious uh, factors, like I said, medical practices and institutionalized medical practices, nothing new to Asia, although it was fairly early compared to Europe, in India and China, particular influencers, not necessarily by direct fusion of, of Southeast Asia, were had well established by the Han Dynasty and early on in, in India, you know, kind of formalized uh, or uh, at least in medical concepts and institutions and practitioners. And this is part of uh, Homo sapiens in general, and I won't go into details on that and the evolutionary theory behind it. So how much influence there were and how much local invention and adaptation, but certainly Jai Varman uh, seventh had established a state level uh, supply and control and formation. Now, why did it just seem to have disappear? And this also goes with a lot of things after Jai Varman the seventh, a few subsequent queen, uh, kings uh, just kind of fell into disuse along with Angkor Tom, much more so even than Angkor Wat was covered by forest by the time people in early uh, colonial history showed up and were taken there. Now, was it just an economic collapse and lack of support? But then you got people like Cho Tak Wan who come and visit later and uh, his description of medical practices seems pretty by comparison to what he was familiar with in, in China, seems to kind of put it is less evolved and developed than it had been during Jai Varman VII's and previous uh, eras. Uh, it rains. So what happened? And also Choto Kwan, we got to see is, you know, was this guy a medical expert or just looking at one thing? Uh, is that one, one or a few descriptions uh, really the state of things at the time? Or was that just kind of a, his perspective for various reasons? Anyway, I'll end on that because I'm more curious about these uh, questions and answers than anything else. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Carl, for your presentation. And now we we all done for uh, five reason uh, the speakers. And now I want to move to the Q and A session. Uh, we have only ten minutes for the Q and A session. So far, we received uh, three, four questions. Uh, one question already uh, answered by uh, Professor. Uh, Dr. Thirty Chime about relating to whether any evidence of wooden structure uh, in the hospital. So, uh, 
the next, I want to select uh, the question uh, uh, in the Q&A chat box, which uh, straight to the Dr. Uh, uh, Riti Cham and uh, Peter Sarok. Uh, Peter and uh, uh, Dr. Riti, do you see the do you do you see the 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 question? Do you see the question in the the Q and A chat box? Would you mind reading for us? I I'm I'm worried, but I also drop in the chat box in yeah. the the chat box. Okay. You can read it, but I I will also read read it. Uh. What's your comment on the alchemy and the offering of uh, medical herb? How would you describe the relation between uh, pharmacology in traditional Khmer medicine and uh, the creation of this uh, pub publicly accessed ancient hospital? Do, do you get Peter? a... Peter, you want to answer or I can start? Yeah. Uh... <laughs> Think you've done more work on this, Reti. Okay, good. Okay, so uh, briefly, uh, uh, first first step to understand is that not to use uh, our mind of a modern person, a mind doctor, to understand what's going on there. In the ancient time, the anatomy of human body represent the cosmos. You know, so our body is a microcosm of the macrocosm, made of air. I don't know, a, a wind. Uh, 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 earth, uh, fire, and water. So that's number one. That's the reason why they use alchemy to, uh, you know, try to reach eternal life. And herbal medicine is used also very heavily because uh, there's only natural product by that time used by empirical uh, ex experimentation and observation. The good thing is that uh, that I have looked at how a uh, the practice of a uh, medicine during Angkor has been transmitted to the modern time. And definitely there is a transmission, there is a continuity between a Ayurvedic medicine, Buddhist medicine and traditional Khmer medicine. One example is that the famous uh, uh, medical companion, Susuta Samhita has been mentioned at Angkor in this, I think it is still the Lully. So it's known there. And one important, uh, a, a, a very uh, particular fact is that in the Susruta Samhita, that famous uh, uh, mythical uh, ancient doctors of India, is that the human body is made of 400 bones. Uh, and 400 bones, and you can see, I, I translated and edited a few uh, uh, medical manuscripts from the 19th century in Cambodia, and they also count 400 uh, uh, bones also. There's a lot of uh, this transmission. And I, I with uh, my colleague Michelle on in Paris, uh, which uh, you can find that article in Academia EDU also. We translated a manuscript and uh, they mentioned about a pulse hacking in there. So uh, definitely there is a, a link between Ayurvedic medicine, Buddhist medicine during Angkor, and uh, traditional Khmer medicine in the modern time because of the presence of those uh, uh, practices that uh, come out uh, to these, uh, uh, these days. Yeah? I hope I have answered this question. Uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for answering the question. Uh, Peter, do you want to add something on the question? Uh, yes, I, I will just uh, uh, add that we, uh, I don't know that the archaeologists are going to find any remains of wood around the temples, but the, we assume that there was a, there were large wooden um, uh, structures to house the people, to house the patients, to house the uh, the specialists, uh, the specialists, um, and the medicines and so on, which have all disappeared. I don't know whether lidar will eventually well, pick that up. I'm going to jump in real quick and answer that. We yeah. found plenty of roof tiles, which are indicative of wooden buildings, oh, yeah. roof tiles, you know, in ceramic, and we did find post holes, and these include structures you know, 50, 100 meters behind the actual hospital, but still within the within the compound. Certainly the wooden post hole remains of the bridge were there. So certainly there is quite a lot of evidence of wooden structures 
and tile roof structures, that, but not stone structures, which would have been more related to just mm -hmm. temples. Even the king's palace was mostly wood. Uh, thank you. Just a, a quick comment about herbal medicine. I think there's room for further research in the future, interdisciplinary, uh, because number one, there's a lot of a, there's a huge list of a, a herbal of, of plants in the inscription of the foundation stone of hospitals, that number one. There are plenty of uh, a, a, a long list of a, a plan in a medical manuscript from Cambodia in the 19th and 20th century. And also now that we excavate uh, sooner or later, I hope that we can find you know, some uh, uh, mortar pestle or some container that contains some soil there and using a, a paleobotanical technology, uh, some expert may be able to identify and read the data from the inscription from the medical manuscript and from paleobotany doing a, a triangulation, we may be able to find, identify a few uh, herbal, uh, a few plants that have been used as a herbal medicine uh, during Angkor time. Yeah, that's an important point because uh, things like nutmeg mentioned by uh, Dr. Sherrick, uh, you know, uh, that's specifically uh, endemic to East Indonesia, the Spice Islands, Moluccas, and uh, same with clove, which is also mentioned in the Han Dynasty with uh, people who pay, uh, visited the emperor, so to speak, had to have clove in their mouth. And so some of these plants are indicative also and give us a, uh, of a larger value chain that work that spans, you know, thousands of kilometers and uh, gives us information on that. Uh, if I could just add that there is uh, the indication of the personnel involved in each hospital is something like 98, 98 mm -hmm. people, that's including doctors, nurses, uh, uh, astrologers, um, sacrifices, people that made uh, special events. There, were, the, the, there was a, a considerable uh, volume. Sorry, somebody's drilling into the wall beside me. Um, <laughs> but it's... Uh, there was a, there, they were large establishments and there must have been a lot of wood all around the tiny stone part. Okay, thank you so much for answer the first question. I want to move to uh, uh, the next question. Uh, let, let's start from uh, the Q&A box, the same from Swati Chambaka. He, uh, they want to ask, is there any tradition tradition or evidence of a public health facility between 7th century uh, Punjo Darya and uh, 12th century uh, Chaiman uh, uh, 7. I will drop the, the question in the chat box again. Uh, you, you can see, I think they, you can see it. Uh, uh, do any speaker want to uh, to reply to answer to the, the question well i'll start off because it, it's is there any historical evidence is there any inscriptional evidence is there any archaeological evidence is there any secondhand source evidence you know uh like uh from visitors and things like that well i i would put money on there is archaeological evidence that probably mm -hmm. supports this but we just haven't identified it or found it yet and I, I, I would, I would assume so. Now, at the scale formalized and ordained by Jai Varm VII, remember he he implemented massive, huge changes in things across the board. But the existence of medical treatment, medical facilities, medical education, medical training, and stuff like that, and facilities to support this, in places to go, I'm sure existed. It's a matter of identifying and finding it. Yeah, I, I, I would add this. I, what we're talking, when we talk about Buddhist medicine in this public health system, this is the official medicine health system. But definitely, like any civilization, even before the, when we reach the peak of Angkor, there are always a system, a health system in the village, a healer, traditional healing, but without using a companion, without using text. I take one example at the excavation of Brekame. We found a, a skeleton from... Uh, 2,500 uh, years, so long before Angkor, and we study, uh, well, I actually Kyle and I, and uh, I, by that time, we studied that skeleton, and we found that uh, that, uh, that person, that man, because he uh, turned to be a man, uh, and has a fracture of the distal femur that had 
that has healed. So what does it mean in terms of inference, in terms of healthcare? Probably, definitely, in that village, there were a bone setter. You know, who was able to immobilize the fracture of the femur. Without a proper immobilization using bamboo stick, using wood, it would not heal. But the fracture has healed in a, 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 a wrong position with malalignment. And this is only a reflect that they were a, the bone setter was able to take care of the patient. The family was able to feed the patient to survive six, six months of fracture. But they have not discovered yet the traction to align the fracture. So definitely, um, there is, uh, we have, we, we should not be you know, focusing that the healthcare system exists only at the official level at the empire, but there's certainly a bone setting, a bone setter and healer within each village by practicing very rudimentary um, medicine without using a very uh, sophisticated medical compendium. I hope we have answered your question, yeah? And Puno Danya, yeah, Puno Danya was uh, just a an account from a Chinese, uh, 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 from Chinese account. He knew that he has been a Buddhist monk who who was sent to to ancient Angkor to ancient Cambodia to collect to collect the uh, the uh, the herbal medicine. But we know also that according to the Chinese account, that I think in the fifth or sixth century, uh, two monks from Cambodia went to China. And spend years there, and was one never came back to translate the a, a, a sacred text from Sanskrit to Chinese. So there's a lot of exchange between China and Cambodia in the ancient time. At the Chang level. Chang Tai and yeah, others. Chang Tai. Yes. I think that was Swati's question, and thank you, Swati. I'm glad you're here. Good, good to virtually be in your presence. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Now we run out of time for the Q and A question now. Uh, uh, I want to close the, the, the session one and I uh, would like to say thank you so much for all the speaker for your presentation and, and also your answer, uh, uh, your answer to, to the question and, and provide a broad of information about Buddhism and, and medical or, uh, system um, in, uh, the ancient, in, 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 in the ancient Khmer. So I want to close this session. I want next. I want to invite Kershaw Logo to chair the uh, the second part of the conference. Thank you so much. The floor is your uh, place. Uh, Hello, everybody. So um, yeah, thank you all of the presenters and um, Peter also for organizing us and. Uh, it's, um, it's great to be here with everybody. Um, so my understanding of the second panel is that what we'll be doing is um, providing some broader context, some comparative context, um, so that we can understand the archeological um, and, and epigraphic evidence that you've just been talking about um, within a larger history of Buddhism and medicine in Asia more broadly. And um, so we have some panelists that I'll introduce individually in a moment, but um, in, the second, in the second panel, we're going to, to hear from people uh, working on Vietnam, Tibet, and uh, I'm going to start us off with a presentation on China. Um, so I'll, I'll introduce myself first. I, I'm Pierce Salguero. I'm a um, associate professor at uh, Penn State University um, Abington College in Philadelphia. And uh, my work has focused on uh, my own um, dissertation work focused on medieval China and um, uh, Buddhist medicine in, in uh, medieval Chinese texts. Uh, for the last um, 10 years, though, my, uh, my role in the field has been more of um, a collector and synthesizer of uh, other people's um, research um, together with my own. Um, and so I'm going to present today uh, uh, a um, overview of some, um, I don't get my screen share going here. I, I'm presenting an overview of some um, materials that I've collected together in a three volume collection uh, related to Buddhism and medicine um, that's come out from Columbia University Press over the last five years. 
the first two volumes published in 2017 and 2020 were um, anthologies uh, with uh, 90, 95 or so chapters um, of translations produced by myself and a team of other scholars working on uh, texts related to Buddhism and medicine from across um, the ancient world uh, all the way up to the contemporary. Um, the third volume, the one on the right, uh, is just out uh, now, this week, uh, from Columbia University also, and this is a synthesis summarizing the history of Buddhism and medicine globally from the beginnings of the Buddhist tradition up until um, 2021, um, deal, the very end deals with COVID. And um, in, this, in this book, I've um, brought together a lot of scholarship that was done um, by disparate groups of scholars um, into sort of like one coherent arc or one coherent narrative of the, um, the history of Buddhism and medicine. So today I'm going to be drawing um, from these, these three volumes, uh, mostly talking about uh, China, um, but also uh, providing a little bit of a broader intercultural um, trans-regional perspective. So um, the place to start, of course, is in India when we're talking about uh, Buddhism and um, Buddhist medicine in India. Um, is something that is maybe a, it's a term that we can debate the applicability of um, when it comes to India. Um, very earliest Buddhist sources from the pre-Mahayana uh, or Nikaya Buddhist tradition don't appear to be presenting a very coherent medical model, although they definitely do draw upon the medical knowledge of ancient India, very similar to um, what you find in the Ayurvedic corpus. As Buddhism develops in India, the emergence of Mahayana and Vajrayana traditions, but, um, medicine becomes much more central within the Buddhist um, textual corpus. And so you have an increasing focus on healing and uh, medical knowledge as time goes on in India. The texts that are written in India um, are tra transported and translated all across Asia, um, as we know. And so in, in many ways, Buddhist texts and Buddhist um, uh, knowledge becomes a kind of a vehicle for medical exchange between different regions of, of Asia. Um, in my field, I'm a historian of medicine. My PhD is in the history of medicine. Uh, we tend to approach Asian medical traditions sort of in silos where, you know, people who work on Ayurveda work on Ayurveda and people that work on Chinese medicine work on Chinese medicine. And uh, looking at Buddhism, it requires us to sort of um, to, to, to cross across these silos because uh, Buddhism in many ways was cross-pollinating, um, carrying or a catalyst for the, for the transmission of, um, of, of medical knowledge around Asia, across cultures, across languages. And um, very much Southeast Asia is, is, is very a central part of this um, network of exchange. Uh, my approach to the um, uh, to this kind of large picture of transcultural, trans uh, regional exchange is to think about um, networks and nodes where exchange happened, uh, where we have historical records of people from varying backgrounds, varying different uh, locations getting together. Um, we have records of people like Punyadara, for example, or I Ching, uh, a Chinese pilgrim who went to India and studied medicine at Nalanda. We have many records of uh, um, exchange between um, uh, India and East Asia, between South, Southeast Asia and Tibet and, and, and so on and so forth. Just sort of a, a larger picture of a circulation of knowledge throughout, um, throughout Asia. Um, and we have lo locations where we have uh, important um, collections of texts or archaeological materials are, are, are noted here on the slide. The Khmer Empire is one of the uh, most, I think, most significant archaeological um, sites in the world for the study of Buddhist medicine in the pre-modern period. Um, if, we, if we 
focus on China, um, the point I want to start by making is just that, um, you know, when, when people think of Chinese medicine uh, today, we think of acupuncture and herbs and so forth. And, and um, that's very much a product of um, I, these, these traditions did exist in ancient times. Um, but uh, for the medieval period, which is the period that I study, um, medicine was much more pluralistic uh, and there were many different types of uh, healing uh, and, and a lot of crossover between what we would think of as religious and medical um, interventions. And so Buddhist, in, Buddhist uh, healing, Buddhist techniques, Buddhist knowledge about the body um, were entering into China during this period and were very much a part of the um, sort of the pluralistic uh, medical culture of the time. Um, I want to talk about some of the uh, important threads of medicine and healing knowledge that, that uh, were very influential in China. Um, there was the introduction of healing deities. Um, for example, um, we, we have here Avalokiteshvara and also um, the medicine Buddha, Baishaja Guru, um, in a more of a uh, Chinese uh, or East Asian mode of, of uh, depicting. Um, these figures were uh, extremely important cultically. We have, we have a lot of evidence of um, uh, rituals and, and um, um, uh, other, or other sorts of cultic activity surrounding these deities um, for healing purposes, um, including at the uh, imperial level. Um, one, one of the sort of techniques that is very common in, in medieval China, Chinese texts are dharani, which are uh, chants or, or spells, you could say, for preventing various types of uh, ailments. And we have um, detailed collections of dharanis from the medieval period that, that give us a whole range of different spells for all sorts of different, um, different conditions. Uh, related to dharanis, we have uh, um, uh, many uh, talismans and seals. These would, would have been um, graphic uh, tools that are used either um, on, on fabric or they could be um, put on paper and burned and, and, and uh, ingested um, that would, would have been intended for the prevention as well as the cure of disease. Um, there's a whole uh, demonology that, that uh, um, China inherits from, from India that comes along with Buddhism. Um, not only different types of demons, new, new types of demons, um, disease causing demons like the grahas that are shown here um, on this slide, uh, but also a whole range of, um, of different types of um, uh, remedies for, for demon uh, assault. Uh, and these include um, the dharanis and the, the, the talismans that I just mentioned, but also all kinds of herbal remedies and other kinds of um, ritual interventions. Um, a lot of people today are interested in the uh, healing benefits or the stress reduction benefits of mindfulness meditation. This is uh, nothing new. Um, Buddhist meditations have been linked with um, uh, healing since, uh, the, since almost the very beginning of the tradition. In China, uh, frequently there was an emphasis on the um, uh, healing effects of meditation. Um, my, oops, sorry, my slide here is also suggesting that we be aware of the danger of meditation illness, um, which is something that the texts talk about as well, which is to say that too much meditation or meditation done in the wrong way can cause illness. Um, the, the Chinese, medieval Chinese texts uh, have a lot to say about that, um, which is the subject of my current, my sort of next research project. Um, so we don't have the kinds of archaeological um, sites that uh, we've been talking about in Cambodia and uh, Thailand um, uh, in China. Uh, but I wanted to share with you uh, a sort of um, idealized map of what a Chinese temple properly should look like um, that is uh, produced in, this, in the early 7th century. And if you look at the very uh, right hand side of this map and we zoom in, you can find that they are advocating uh, or, or suggesting that the temple, the ideal temple should include a hospice, a dispensary, an infirmary, um, and also incidentally uh, running water toilets as well. So um, the sort of ideal, ideal temple in the Tang Dynasty China um, would have included these kinds of facilities within the, within the grounds of the temple. 
Um, in I wanted to connect uh, some themes from medieval China with what we've been talking about in the Khmer Empire. And one, one way to do that is to talk about the role of uh, Buddhist charity in the legitimization of rulers. And this is something we know all the way back from India with uh, King Ashoka, and it's been a sort of a repeated theme throughout uh, Buddhist, Buddhist cultures um, in the pre-modern period where uh, rulers are um, uh, very interested in promoting their, their own image as uh, magnanimous uh, uh, donors of, um, you know, money and resources to the Sangha, to the temple structures, um, and specifically to uh, medical charity. And so in China, um, probably the most notable example of this would be Empress Wu Zetian um, in the late 7th and 8th century when she uh, briefly took over and became the only female emperor of China. Um, she supported um, uh, a network of imperial temples, uh, which also included um, uh, some kind of um, dispensaries and, and, and medical facilities as well, um, as part of her efforts to legitimize her own her own rule. Um, so very, I think, uh, resonant with what uh, Jayavarman VII was doing. Um, so my um, third volume, the one that is sort of presenting um, these uh, um, different um, sort of a summary of all of this material talks about three different trajectories uh, within sort of the larger history of uh, Buddhism and medicine in Asia. And I want to end just with this with this slide, just sort of um, placing Southeast Asia within um, the sort of larger global history of Buddhism and medicine. So in the first place, uh, there are many parts of Asia where Buddhism is no longer the primary religion practiced. And so in those parts of the world, Buddhist medicine uh, phased out or was absorbed into um, Islamic and Hindu practices. Um, then you have in East Asia, a, um, a, a process of translation where Buddhist healing knowledge came to be most under, most readily understood and talked about within the, the East Asian medical framework of qi and yin yang. And then you have this region um, in between the two um, where, where Buddhist traditions coming originally from India combined with uh, local uh, knowledge as well as some Chinese knowledge, in some cases Islamic knowledge as well, and became um, uh, independent um, forms of traditional medicine. And so, and these continued to grow in, in, independently in different parts of Southeast Asia and Central Asia, so that today we have Tibetan medicine and traditional Khmer medicine, Thai medicine, Mongol medicine, etc. cetera. Um, all of these traditions really have their roots in this um, inheritance of, of Buddhist medicine from India, as well as from local traditions. Um, I'm going to stop there so that I stay within my time and uh, wanted to um, turn my attention over to our next speaker. So um, let me just pull that up right here. Okay. All right. Our next speaker is going to be Michelle Thompson, who is professor of Southeast Asian history at the uh, Southern Connecticut State University. And uh, Michelle most recently um, has been working on a, um, a, a, a project sponsored by the National Library of Medicine in the US on the history of vaccination for smallpox in Southeast Asia. I think that's quite relevant uh, to um, the world today. Um, and, um, but, but she's here to talk to us about her current work on Buddhism and medicine in Vietnam with a particular focus on a 13th century uh, monk physician named uh, Doi Din, and you can correct my tones on that, Michelle, when you talk. And uh, her presentation today is uh, Vietnam, Tron Dynasty, and the celebrated monk Doi Din. So Michelle, take it away. Thanks very much, Pierce. And uh, your pronunciation is just fine, but it's 14th century, not 13th century. <laughs> um, I'd like to, before I, I share screen, I'd like to offer my thanks to the organizers of this this has just been already just incredibly valuable to me. And I very much look forward to the rest of the presentations today and to working with everyone further on this, hopefully this coming summer. Now, let me see if I can do share screen correctly. 
Okay, so today I'm going to go over what I think of as a sort of a uh, preview of a book that I hope to be submitting to a press by the time of the real new year when we start the uh, year of the tiger. And that is Selections from the Gardens of Tranquil Wisdom, Dwight Tim, Vietnamese Buddhism and Healthcare in China Dynasty, Vietnam. So Tranquil Wisdom was the is the translation of the Dharma name of uh, the monk Dwight Tin. And because he was not only a monk, he was also a physician, a pharmacist, and uh, a gardener, a very famous gardener, mostly creating medical gardens, I decided that my book would be titled The Gardens of Tranquil Wisdom, partly because I intend to uh, somewhat emphasize the medical gardening part of his uh, career. So, Dwight Ten is a semi-legendary man. He was born Wen Ba Ten. But even his, his birth date is not really known. Uh, various authors put it as 1308, 1311, 1330, as late as 1331. There is some agreement that he died in China, not in Vietnam, uh, around 1400. He's said to have been the author of the oldest Vietnamese medical text, the Nam Zuc Tan Hiu, Miraculous Drugs of the South. Now, the extant text, which was not printed until the 18th century, is clearly accretional. But I believe that Dwight Tan wrote what could be considered a draft of this text sometime between his arrival in Nanjing as part of a Vietnamese diplomatic mission in 1385 and his death around 1400. So I see Dwight Tan as actually having sort of three parts to him. There is a historic man, Wen Ba Ten. He was a real person, even though very, very little is known about him. There's also a sort of a legendary Dwei Ten, and much more is known about him. And he had many, many, many accomplishments. Some of these accomplishments, I am convinced, incorporate the actual accomplishments of other monks who happen to have the Dharma name Dwei Ten. Uh, at a later period than the historic Dwei Tan, this was not an uncommon Dharma name for, for monks to take. So for this reason and some others, my conception is that the historic Dwei Tan and the legendary Dwei Tan sort of meld into what I think of as a symbolic Dwei Tan. So I can prove very little about the historic Dwei Tan. And while it's been a very, very interesting and at some points in time frustrating, uh, experience examining the legendary Dwei Ten, I've come to feel that the principal importance of both of these Dwei Tens is the fact that they symbolize the place of the Vietnamese Buddhist Sangha in healthcare and the relationship of the peoples. And by here, I mean, not just the ethnic Vietnamese, I mean, the various peoples of the territory of Vietnam. So the peoples of Vietnam to the land of Vietnam itself. Okay, this is a statue of Dwei Ten, done, of course, centuries after his death, in the pagoda Chua Zam, where he is said to have spent large parts of his childhood. So for pagodas closely associated with his legend, he forms not only a sort of a, a, um, a sort of a spirit of the land that's also incorporated into the pantheon of those particular pagodas, but also a sort of a, a deity that is worshipped by local villagers as being part of uh, their history and their spiritual, uh, spiritual world. So this is the territory of Dwight Tan's childhood. At, the point, at that point in time, uh, Vietnam most certainly did not extend in the long north-south reach that it has today. It was mostly uh, basically the, the northern one-third of what is today Vietnam. Now, this area, this is the area most closely associated with his childhood. And this is the area associated sort of with his adulthood before he was sent to China. So all of this encompasses what was at that time the heartland of Vietnamese Buddhism. And that exact same heartland was also the heartland of Vietnamese medicine and pharmacology. And that has a tie into some of the earlier presentations today in that you'll see that this incorporates sort of at least the edges of where the Red River Delta hits the mountains that surround it. And there is a 
connected to his legend and connected to actual historic fact. There's supposedly a lot of interaction between him and uh, various minority people who lived in the mountains, etc. And it sort of indicates a relationship between them, the gathering of medicinal herbs, and perhaps the transplantation of some of those herbs into the medical gardens that he is said to have founded. In fact, I think you can say that while Vietnamese Buddhist, mostly monasteries, were not organized into anything like as systemic a national healthcare apparatus as existed in Cambodia, they did in fact constitute the de facto public health system in Vietnam in at least the 12th to the 14th centuries. And this also relates to what Pierce just had to say in that uh, not only Buddhist, not only Vietnamese Buddhist rulers, but uh, members of the aristocracy, et cetera, used contributions, including some that were uh, designated contributions for, for to support medical gardens and to support uh, charity clinics for the poor. These were tools of legitimation include, and tools by which rulers and the aristocracy used to tie themselves to the land and the people of various villages and various uh, pagodas. So I think perhaps the most important point of my book is that while I can prove almost nothing about the, what the historic Dwey Tin did or he accomplished in specific terms of medical work, I can demonstrate that numerous monks and nuns of the time did many of the things he is said to have done. So this is one of the reasons my contention is that his level symbolizes this. Uh, and there's reasons why his name has come down to us and perhaps some of those others have not. So there's basically eight points that constitute both the history of the actual man that we know of and the legend of Dwayne Tent. So he was named Wen Ba Tan at birth and he was raised as an orphan in a Buddhist pagoda after losing his parents at age six. Now I should make the point here that age six, basically I've come to feel in the process of writing this book that every single number associated with the legend of this man is symbolic because there's no evidence that it was actually specifically age six. And for each of these numbers in the book, I go into why I think they're symbolic, but I think that would take up too much time right here. So point number two, he was a brilliant child, adolescent, and young adult who studied Buddhist and Confucian texts in classical Chinese, and he passed the imperial level Confucian exams at the very young age of 22. 22 is also a symbolic number. In fact, uh, if you look at the various birth dates proposed for him, it's impossible that he passed those exams at 22 because those exams were not given in any of the years that he would have been 22. So the number is clearly symbolic. The fact that he passed the exams is not. It's recorded that uh, he did translation work, et cetera, and that he had passed these exams. Um, he was also, the historic Dwey Tan was also known for his translation work in Nome and in Sanskrit. Point number three, uh, after passing the exams, he turned down a job at the China Royal Court and he became a monk and he took the name Dwey Tan. Number four, after becoming a fully ordained monk, he spent the next several decades, uh, exactly how long it would be dependent on how, when his birthday was and how old he was. But he spent the next several decades wandering around Vietnam, practicing medicine and founding medical guards. 24 is the number usually given. Um, I find that the number 24 is also symbolic. And I had a lot of fun trying to find all of these 24 pagodas before I decided that that number was symbolic. Now, I'll let everybody read the, the rest of these points on this slide by themselves since I've been given the prompt that I only have two minutes left. So after being sent to China when he was approximately uh, 55 uh, or definitely with the mission of 1385, he became a top ranked member of the palace medical service and performed wonderful cures such as saving an emperor from death due to complications of childhood. Now this is also, most of this is completely unlikely because there was no woman with the rank of empress during the time that he is said to have lived in China. But the fact that he became part of the medical service is almost certainly true because he had to have a position to stay in the main court at all, and he probably would have been assigned to the medical service. Now, he was never allowed to return to Vietnam, and he died in China, having requested that his tomb contain a, um, a request to, to go back home. So 
I think that this request carved on a stele that was erected in his home village to whoever goes southward, take me with thee. And there are a number of different translations of this. I think this is one of the reasons that his legend remains so important for the Vietnamese because this is a very poignant, a very, very humane uh, tale. I mean, it's one of the reasons that I'm so fascinated by him myself. After all, um, you know, it's very, very, unheard of for scholars to know almost anything about the personal feelings of a non-royal, non-aristocratic 14th century Vietnamese man. But as surely as we can know anything about such a person, we know that Dwayne Tin wanted to go home. Now, I'd like to use my little bit of a remaining time to talk about modern connections. So almost any city of any size in certainly Northern and Central Vietnam has a street named for Dwayne Tin. This particular one with a street sign on it is on the corner where the National Institute of Traditional Medicine exists, and that's not an accident. Now this, uh, again, ties into sacks of medical herbs. So this is uh, this, one of the storerooms at a place that I believe Pierce has also been. There's an entire network right now of Buddhist charity medical clinics, and they are called Duong Dui Tin. Now that can be translated in a couple of different ways. The dung can be a type of road. It's usually trans translated as boulevard. So you can consider this as being the way of Dwayne Tan. But another way to translate dung is place. And so this is Dwayne Tan's place. So just to conclude, Pierce. So I would say that this modern connection um, sort of symbolizes the fact that contemporary current Vietnamese Buddhists see a connection to Dwayne Tan in what is called engaged Buddhism and in current Buddhist medical practice uh, within Vietnam. Okay, I'll conclude there. Thank you, Michelle. I, I like uh, that you were watching me so I didn't have to interrupt you. So um, we can continue doing that with the other panelists too. Um, so um, the next panelist is going to be Colin Millard and uh, Colin is uh, currently a senior lecturer right. in medical anthropology at Newcastle University, uh, specializing in medical anthropology and the social anthropology of South Asia and Tibet. Um, he's carried out extensive field work in, in Nepal, India, and Tibet on Tibetan medicine, Bun medicine, and the healing rituals of, of Nagpa householder priests. So Colin is going to be speaking to us today about ancient Tibetan herbal blessing ceremony uh, that he witnessed in Nepal. So Colin, the floor is yours. Uh, hello everybody, I'm just trying to share my screen first of all. Okay, got it. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Yes, yes, carry on. All right, so, um, so um, Pierce has just introduced me, so I don't really need to say much about myself. So my background is in medical anth anthropology. I currently work at Newcastle University in the medical school, mostly working in global health. But for many years, I've also been doing research on Tibetan medicine and the anthropology of Tibet and Nepal. And uh, at various points, I've, um, I've done studies on Tibetan medicine. And I had the good fortune of uh, witnessing this ritual, um, this bond medicine ritual called the uh, Osa Kyulpa, the light infused medicine. Um, it's a Bon ritual, so Bon is a religion, a lineage of Tibetan Buddhism going back to Buddha Tempa Chenra, uh, who you can uh, see in this slide here. Uh, the lineage of this medicine also go back, goes back to him. It's rarely performed. Uh, I've uh, had the good fortune, as I say, I've seen it two times now, performed in Trichin Bo Trichin Bon Monastery in Kathmandu in 1998 and the second time in 2012. Uh, the ritual takes uh, many months of preparation, collecting all the required medical, medical ingredients and preparing the ritual objects. About 120, to 120 medicinal ingredients are used. Uh, most of the medicines are collected from the hills in Nepal. Uh, some need to be bought from traditional herb suppliers. Now, this slide shows the Tibetan doctor Antony Masampo collecting medicines from hills near his home in Mustang, and a medicine supplier in Kathmandu where some of the medicine ingredients were bought. Antony Nima Sample and his teacher, 
Auntie Gege, shown at the bottom of the slide there, played a lead role in collecting the medicines for the rituals. Uh, as I said, the ritual takes months of preparation and about two weeks to perform. The purpose of the ritual is uh, alchemical, we can say. It is to transform the 120 medicinal ingredients into a healing nectar, nectar to heal the 400 classes of diseases in Tibetan medicine. At the same time, the five mental poisons of the ritual participants are transformed into transcendental wisdoms. In addition to the monks living in the monastery, on both occasions, a few hundred people attended the ritual from bond communities in Nepal. Around 20 Nagpa, bond Nagpas, that's um, household of priests from Dolpo and the Lubrak regions of Nepal, also attended and took part in the ritual. The principal ritual activities were underta undertaken by um, 32 monks, 12 of them in the main text. The Tibetan Lama carrying out the tantric empowerments was Yongzin Tenzin Nandak, who is shown at the top on this slide here. Uh, the transformative power of the ritual comes from the main deity, Shidro. The de the, this deity has two aspects, a peaceful aspect called Shiva, who emanates 45 deities, and a wrathful aspect called Troa, who emanates 86 deities, these deities represent various aspects of our psychophysical continuum. Uh, so the ritual happens in various stages. The first stage of the ritual is to purify the place. This is done by making offerings to the local spirits, the so-called Lu offering, which you can see in the slide here, and then taking permission from the Sadak, the land owning spirit, by taking soil from the ground, which is considered to be the sadak stomach. This is then used for the base of the mandala in the ritual. Uh, the next step is marking the ritual boundary by establishing the four principal protecting deities in each of the cardinal points at the boundary of the ritual space. Then the ritual spheres called Waldum representing Rothral deities are set up, which you can see in this slide. The next step is to set up the mandala of the, of the deities. Here are the mandalas of the two deities. In the picture here, it appears as a, a, a beautiful geo geographic two-dimensional form. But during the ritual, the practitioners visualize it, visualize it as a three-dimensional palace. The 86 wrathful and the 45 peaceful deities have specific locations in this palace. There are two classes of objects that are placed on the mandala. The first group of objects include a range of ritual items that are common to all tantric ritual practice, including ritual daggers and ritual claws, which you can see in the slide there. The second group of objects are the special objects, which are specific to the Mendrup Osa Kilpa ritual. That is the pots containing the medicinal ingredients. The contents of the medicinal pots and their location on, on the mandala are central to the ritual activity. Five pots contain the five root medicines. These, co these correspond to the five elements. These correspond to the five elements, the five mental poisons, the five Buddhas, the five transcendental wisdoms and the five cardinal points. Through the ritual, these medicines are transformed into healing nectars. At the same time, the five mental poisons of the participants have transformed into transcendental wisdoms. wisdoms. Four pots contain the branch medicines. These correspond to the eight groups of consciousness that are realized as the eight deities of the nature of the mind. All of the five root medicine pots contain nine common medicines. The famous three fruits, Aru, Baro, and Kiru, and the six good medicines listed on the slide here. Um, each of the medicines also contain a special medicine. Uh, some of these are a little bit difficult to find, but um, um, this is overcome by using some of the medicine from the previous ritual, which carries the empowerments and the blessings of all previous rituals. 
Um, the root medicine of space element contains the nine common medicines, the medicine of space, which you can see here written on the slide, and plus two special medicines, the sperm of a young white boy with bright eyes and the sperm of a senkitogal, a kind of lion. Um, uh, through this process, the mental poison of anger is realized as the wisdom of emptiness. Um, the root medicine of the earth element contains nine common medicines. The medicine of earth plus three special medicine, three, three special medicines, the flesh of a young virgin girl, a special kind of meat, meat referred to in Tibetan as Sangsha Chiwisha, and, and elephant heart meat. Uh, through this pot, the mental poison of ignorance is realized as the mirror-like mirror wisdom. Um, the root medicine of air um, contains nine common medicines. The medicine of air and one special medicine, the excrement, excrement, the excrement taken while it is running of a horse with a body that is a reddish grey and with a blue tail and mane. Through this pot, the mental poison of pride is realized of the equalizing wisdom. Um, and then we've got the medicine of uh, fire, um, contains nine common medicines. Um, the medicine of fire plus two special medicines, the menstruation of menstrual blood of a girl whose skin is bright and of reddish colour, and the blood of red birds. Through this pot, through this pot the mental poison of desire is realised as discriminating wisdom. And uh, then we're moving on to um, water. Um, the root medicine of water element contains nine common medicines. Um, medicine of water plus three special medicines the urine of a bright, bright brown boy, the urine of a bright blue girl, and the urine of a mute dragon. And then we have the 17 um, branches of medicines. Um, these are in the four pots in the intermediate regions, which, as you can see, um, contain the five organs of the consciousness of any animal. The pots, when these are all assembled, the pots are brought to the mandala uh, by clean boys and girls who represent Dakinis. The practitioners then invite the nectar to the medicine. They do this by reciting prayers and mantras and making downward movements with ritual arrows, bells and drums in a gesture of invitation. In this fashion, they escort the young boys and girls carrying the medicine pots. Um, the medicines are then located on the mandala. Um, you can see them here. They're actually located on top of a, a glass platform on the print of the mandala. The sand mandala is actually underneath it. Once they're in the location, um, the prayers and the mantras are, are recited for a few days. Uh, the pr pr prayers, I'm just going to finish, Pierce. The, the prayers are, um, are first done for the peaceful deity, and then they're done for the wrathful deity. Uh, the prayers are supposed to be done for the, the raw medicines first. And then everything's supposed to be, um, then it's all done again for the, it's all supposed to be powdered and then done again for the powdered medicines. These were all powdered originally. So when, um, when uh, midpoint of the ritual, all the medicines were taken out, as you can see down and you can see here, and they were symbolically um, powdered. Then everything was put back on there. There's a lot of medicine, as you can see, maybe hundreds of kilos of medicine. At the end of the ritual, um, after the final empowerment of the Tantric deity, uh, small bags of, of the uh, medicine are distributed to all the, all the participants. Okay, right in there. Thank you, Colin. Um, it's really interesting how many um, connections we can see between the um, presentations and, and uh, in the second panel and those from the first panel. So um, thank you for bringing out those, those connections, both of you. Um, so our next speaker and our final speaker is, uh, is uh, Bill McGrath, and Bill is the Robert Ho Assistant Professor of Buddhist Studies at NYU. Um, his research focuses on intersections of religion and medicine in Tibet, and he recently has published uh, an important edited volume called Knowledge and Context in Tibetan Medicine with, with Brill. And uh, Bill today is going to talk about early Tibetan texts and schools. Take it away, Bill. Thank you, Pierce. Hello, everybody. How do we how do we look? So we good. good. Yeah. Okay. Good. I've got a 
complicated screen setup. I, I might look away, so don't 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 worry if I'm not looking at you all. Um, so I guess first of all, I would like to say thanks, just like everybody else has said thanks. This has been really a surprisingly. I, maybe I shouldn't say surprise. The, the, like Pierce was saying, the connections have really surprised me, right? Uh, as you can see on my first slide, there's also a mandala, just like Colin was describing. Um, and just like many of these archaeological uh, diagrams were also sort of uh, showing, right? This square, um, symmetrical, kind of cosmological design. This is the first, it's a very famous painting for anybody who knows Tibetan medicine. This is the first of a, a series of paintings that were produced around the turn of the 18th century, the end of the 17th, um, by Desi Sanjay Jamso based on the four tantras. Um, today, I'll be speaking about what I'm calling the Yutok school of Buddhist medicine. This is not actually a very well-known term. And some of the things I might say are controversial for the world of Sarikpa, but here we go. Um, I'm gonna talk fast because we're doing the, what's it called? Pecha Kucha. Pecha is how you say book in Tibetan. So I, it's sort of a funny word to hear in Japanese too. Um, Sarikpa, maybe you've heard this word, maybe you haven't. It's a Tibetan word, but it's also a translation of a Sanskrit word. So when people use it as if to present a uniquely Tibetan vision of medicine, it's a, it's a little bit, um, what to say, misinformed, right? Uh, Chikiti Savidya is one of the five fields of knowledge that are translated into Tibetan around the turn of the 11th century with the development of kind of new schools in, in Tibet. You get Pandita who are scholars of these five fields, medicine being one of them. So it's really, an, an, a, a, a let's say, a uh, cosmopolitan system thinking about medicine as part of a larger Buddhist system of knowledge. So one thing I will talk about today is Sarikpa. Another I will talk about is the four tantras. Some people translate as the four treatises. I will argue today that that is also misleading. Um, it's the most important book in Sarikpa. Uh, and I will also talk about Yutok most important person in Sarikpa, actually very similar to uh, Michelle's presentation, kind of a legendary figure. I'm gonna do what I can to talk about them. As you can see, I'm already talking about way too much stuff. So I'm gonna talk really fast. Please take some notes and we can discuss uh, in the subsequent period. What I'm arguing is this is a school, right? The Yutok school is a Buddhist school of medicine that first developed in Tibet. Nobody really uses this term. I want to introduce it. Um, Sarikpa, Here's uh, the results of a project called Reassembling Tibetan Medicine. Uh, Stefan Klus was the, the, the PI for the project, but you can see the team here in the image. Um, one of the main takeaways that I see in this image is that medicine, Tibetan medicine is big. You can see it in small print there, 200 and sorry, 615.3 million USD, right? The Sarikpa industry in Asia produced pharmaceuticals worth 615.3 million USD. That is big business. And it's not entirely clear from this presentation, but it's all coming from China, right? 97.5 of the market is within China. It's distributed here across the TAR, Qinghai, Gansu, Inner Mongolia, Sutran, Yunnan. But this is, this is where we're talking about China here. A very small percentage of this production is in India and in Mongolia, a very even smaller percentage in Bhutan. Um, but maybe more interestingly, despite China being the center for production, it is a global phenomenon, right? Maybe some folks here in the audience have taken Tibetan medicine. Um, and, and so this is a, a map causing us to think about where that medicine comes from. This sort of lines up with Pierce's bubbles. I'm gonna actually pop one of his big bubbles in the middle. He's calling, I, I, I know he didn't do this on purpose, but Sining was in his green East Asia bump, Lanzhou in his green East Asia bump, Inner Mongolia in his green East Asia bump. No, 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 this is bigger. Sorikpa is huge, right? Look at this map, Sorikpa is enormous. Now I would say India is misrepresented here. Parts of Dongbei, or what was once called Manchuria, maybe not always uh, under the, the Sorikpa bubble, but during the Qing, almost certainly the, the Qing Empire also practicing Sorikpa. So long history here, uh, important in subsequent periods of Chinese history, but we're going to talk about the old stuff. We're going to talk about the books because that's what I'm into. I'm into books. So um, what are the four tantras? Here's the book. It's called the Gyushi in Tibetan. Um, it very briefly put, 
it's framed as the teachings of the Buddha, uh, the master of medicine that so many of us have talked about today, but it's not just the master of medicine. As you can see in the illustration here, we've got the blue master of medicine in the middle, uh, but he emanates, he sends out Nirmanakaya, Chukku, he sends out emanations of two sages who then talk to each other. One is Rigpa Yeshe, he's in the upper right corner in this image here. Two is Yilekye, who's the student of Rigpa Yeshe, and the entire text is formed as a conversation between these two emanations that ultimately derive from the medicine Buddha, the Buddha master of medicine. Um, the explanatory tantra, recent work, I guess is getting to be less recent, but Yanga about 10 years ago really proved that the explanatory tantra, in particular, major sections derived from Vagbata's Ashtanga Hirdaya Samhita. I believe this was mentioned in some of the presentations um, on Khmer medicine. It's true for Tibetan medicine too. Very important work, Ashtanga Hirdaya Samhita. The, well, I, I'm calling the essence of the eight branches. Um, it's a, an Ayurvedic work produced, let's say, in the 7th, 8th century, uh, and then it was brought to Tibet around the 11th century. We'll talk about that more later. We're mostly going to talk about um, kind of this narrative framework. We're not really concerned with the contents of the four tantras, which is a very complex subject. Um, moving on, the Yutok school. Again, this is my main argument. Uh, I have three sources I'm going to walk you through today, and again, in sort of the uh, somewhat frantic Pecha Kucha style. Uh, we're just going to take a really brief little glimpse. I'm going to give you kind of the cream of the crop of these three different sources and tell you why they're sort of interesting and, and why they matter. Um, one is by Cherje Zhang de Jigpo. This is a manuscript. It's uh, the only known copy is held in Rome, and I had the good fortune of going to visit it well, right before the pandemic in 2019. Uh, so thank you to the nice people who allowed me to do that. Dan Martin studied this in, in, in 2007. He published kind of a preliminary uh, analysis of the work, but he actually missed something. And, that, you know, no, no criticism of the man. He, it's an amazing work, and he was working from a microfilm. I actually got to go see it, and I got to photograph it. And here's a photo I took. There's a nice kind of drawing at the beginning. As you can see, the opening homage is to Vagbata. It's not to the Buddha. It's to Vagbata. It's saying homage to Vagbata, this author of the Eshtanga Hidaya Samhita. Um, and so he comes, and again, this is a very early, very rare text uh, that was composed in 1204, a wood mouse year, and Martin makes a good argument for why that wood mouse year should be 1204. So the turn of the 13th century, around the same time as many of our Cambodian discussions. Um, so what he says is about 200 years earlier, the Ashtanga Hirdaya Samhita was translated into Tibetan around the year 12 or 1015, a wood rabbit year. This is probably not historically true. Oh, I have two minutes. All right, I got to go even faster. Um, there are other translations that we don't have time to talk about. He talks about many different schools, a Kashmiri school, Tangut school, Tibetan translator, and then Yutok. Here's the first mention of Yutok in a historically datable text that I'm aware of. He talks about a school of Yutok's teacher, Tsalung Dutun, and then Yutok himself. He says there are other schools that are afraid of letters. So what makes this school special is they write things down. I'll let that sink in, even though I don't have much time. They write, it's a scholastic medicine. So this is what is unique about these developments around the Ashtanga Hidaya Samhita. It's scholastic medicine. Um, I don't have time to go through a lot of this. This is how Yutok comes to be remembered. This is an important work by a student of Yutok named Sumdun. What does Sumdun say? He says that he wrote the book. He took notes based on Yutok's work. And then in 1234, which is a Jinna, Jinna horse year, he went to Pagor Temple, which is a real place. It took me time to figure out what this Pagor meant. And I've, I talked to some folks and figured out it's Pagor. He wrote the book. It wasn't Yutok. It was him as his student. Sumdun put it down into writing. Again, writing is really key here. Next, uh, there's sort of a tantric remembering of his master Yutok, remembering Yutok as being like the emanated sage himself as being the student who writes it down. Again, he's pretty clear about this. He says, I wrote this down, everybody, and my teacher was a Buddha, and I'm a Buddha, right? And so it's using tantric imagination to describe where this text comes from. Uh, I don't have really time to talk about the Sakya Medical House. I saw Reiko Shino is in the audience. I cite her here. 
um, talking about the tax structures that developed during the Mongol dynasty, Mongol Empire. Not much time to talk about this, but one thing I'm arguing too is that these are also relevant in Tibet. The category of the medical house develops, and maybe coming back to this question of what is a hospital, what is a medical school, what is a medical house, I think it really comes back to these tax structures are important. Uh, how, how is payment coming for these uh, medicines? Is the government paying for it? Are individuals paying for it? Uh, this becomes clear during the Mongol Empire. There are these ta official tax exemptions that are given to these Tibetan physicians. And so just to conclude, we basically skipped the last part, but that's fine. Uh, Sorikba is a Tibetan language scholastic medicine of all of Central Eurasia. It's not just the Tibetan plateau. Mongolia, uh, Himalayas, really spreads quite widely, even into Manchuria. The Four Tantras is a Buddhist scripture. You treatise translators? No, it's Tantras. The Four Tantras is not a treatise. It is a Buddhist scripture. And the Yutok school is a Buddhist medical school that developed in Tibet and expanded widely during the Mongol Empire. Thank you very much. Here's my bibliography. OK, wonderful. Thank, thanks, Bill. Thanks for firing us up a little bit with some uh, <laughs> some heated arguments there at the, at yeah. the end. <laughs> um, so uh, we are going to move now to the Q&A session uh, following panel number two. And so we have 10 minutes to take uh, questions from the audience as well as panelists. I see maybe uh, maybe Dr. Chem has a uh, a question uh, for, for yeah no Rob. it's uh, thank you Pierce and thank you all the speakers it's been uh, fascinating just briefly because and I will take on your point and as I, I endorse that I, I found the same uh, pattern during my research uh, more than fifteen years now on this uh, Buddhist medicine that actually there's a lot of diffusion of the medical knowledge across the continent you know from Central Asia uh, to Angkor through the Silk Road or uh, through the sea and. When you talk about demonology, I don't know if you uh, come across that book called Kumara Tantra, Dravana, Jean Filioza. See, they have the text in, in Cambodian, Indian, Tibetan, Chinese, and Arabic. So there's a lot of uh, to find out which vision belongs to which. You know? Good luck. Uh, so I, this is a, a, in, in this world of um, you know, violence, of separation, of discrimination. A, medicine and Buddhism and all other religions seem to be completely linked. Yeah. Only medical anthropologists and historians understand that. So this is uh, the message I want to pass, some important point that I have seen. Thank you. Yeah, great point. Thank you. Yeah, add, add the Ravana Kumara Tantra to the uh, the Ashtanga Hridayam Samhita that uh, Bill was just talking about is two of the texts that really circulate all over Eurasia. Um, very important uh, Buddhist Buddhist text. Great. Um, so I don't see a question in the chat in the Q&A for, for this panel. Um, if any, any of our audience members would like to um, ask a question, you're very welcome to. Um, and uh, any, any panelists who would like to jump in, please, by all means, do. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's sure. get Kyle, Kyle to jump in. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's important to note, I just posted this, it's, uh, we're talking and discussing comprehensive medicine and health practices and, and ideologies and everything. So this includes physical and mental and spiritual and cultural and social and so forth. And it's important to, to realize that it, we're not just talking about, you know, physical cures for physical ailments. Um, and that was important uh, just as much in the past, if not more so than it is in the present. Another thing that's important uh, to note is, uh, let me summarize this more succinctly, is one thing I liked about the second panel, panel that was just brilliant, and, and certainly I failed at describing this, but you guys were very clear and, and very good at describing it, to note the evolutionary histories and ecologies, and that means the connections and relations and changes and the overall interconnections of things and not, I mean, the medicines, the tools, the ideas, the preparations, practices, treatments, knowledge, experimentation, uh, which occurs naturally over time with these treatments, it either fails or it succeeds, or it might be correlated to something else. But, you know, this is long term experimentation. And this is much like what, you know, the medical industries and medical anthropology and pharmaceutical companies still do today to go to places like Asia and track these histories and these uses, whether we call them traditional 
medicines or practices. Uh, they have been experimented for hundreds, if not even thousands of generations. And this is a particularly relevant in, uh, in, uh, to primates in which it's not just uh, physically transmitted is, is instincts of you know, what's selected for and against, but also culturally and, and socially transmitted. So why there's uh, influence or emphasis on uh, taking care of uh, pregnant women and females uh, that are viable reproductive uh, part of the societies or social groups and uh, uh, neonatal care and youth care and even the elderly who are experienced and knowledgeable about this and can transmit that uh, culturally, that knowledge and practices and what works and what doesn't. Looks like Michelle's ready to climb through the Zoom window. So to jump in, yeah, Michelle. Go. <laughs> I'd just like to note that um, in the selections from Dwayne Town's book that I published with, with Pierce, um, there are several herbs that are noted as having calming emotional effects. And in the other hundreds of herbs in that book, because of course I couldn't include everything, you know, I would say at least 30, 40% are noted as having some kind of a, an effect that would contribute to mental health. And I'd also like to say, and this was something I didn't get to when at the very end, I sort of ran out of time to, to explore the, the modern connections that I see. I mean, the entire term mindfulness, which is now a multi-billion dollar industry worldwide promoting mindfulness, right? Can be traced back to a term coined by Thich Nhat Hanh, who is considered to be, you know, in the direct line of sort of um, theological descent from the monks of Dwayne Town's time. So emotional and psychological health, yes. Great. So I, I wanted to respond quickly to Kyle's comment too, just about how you were saying that the second panel gave a picture of this sort of ecologies or this more sort of interconnected um, Eurasia. And I, ju I just wanted to acknowledge that the kind of work that I do is absolutely, so that big picture sort of, um, uh, you know, zoom out and tell a large story is absolutely um, at its core um, dependent on the kind of fine grain analysis that archaeologists are doing in in specific locations and as well as textual scholars who are putting so much effort into you know philological puzzles solving these philological puzzles and I wouldn't be able to none of us in panel two would be able to do these kind of broad sweeping histories without that kind of um, that kind of work um, to to um, you know to, to synthesize so um, yeah, we're very much in synergy with each other. Um, so, Bill, you, you had your hand up for a little bit. Thank you. Yes. Um, so I hope that this sparks a larger, more interesting conversation, but I have a very sp specific question for Colin that I've wa been wondering about. Um, so it, there are these really kind of disturbing special ingredients for the ritual that you're describing. And I just wanted to know, did they really use flesh of a young virgin girl? I, I mean, this is something like, um, what's his name? Wiedemeyer's book is saying, no, of course, they don't really eat brains and blah, blah, blah. And I, I just wanted to know what, what source were you using? And did you ask people about this? Like, hey, where, what, what, what are you actually putting in, in, these, in these substances? I did ask them, yeah, obviously. I mean, how, well, how do you get the... Um the excrement of a blue horse while it's running, you know. Oh. Um, so, so it's highly unlikely that some of these ingredients didn't go in there. But so I asked them about it and what they said was um, they, use, they use the previous medicine. So all the blessings, so this ritual has been going on for hundreds, perhaps a thousand years. And um, all the, so every time they retain um, some of the medicine, and that medicine contains all the kind of blessings and the power of the previous medicine, including from those ingredients, those special ingredients. So if they don't have those special ingredients, they can um, they can represent those by using the 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 previous medicine. I didn't look in any of the pots, so I'm I'm not sure about uh, <laughs> whether there was, but I, I'm pretty certain that they they didn't have um, those most of those special ingredients and sperm, certainly not get any sperms of whales and things like this. That's a no, perfect solution. You know, you can buy that in um, the traditional medicine shop in Kathmandu. 
it's a lot of it's symbolic, you know. Um, so uh, it's a part. It's part of the ritual process. Um, there, there was real medicines there. There was 150 real medicines, um, um, but the uh, special ingredients part of the symbolic process of the ritual. Yeah, and that that also I think is Bill's question. You know, it's taken in a slightly different direction um, is relevant to the um, the process of localization of traditions as they move from uh, across cultures and across languages, right? Like what what is a, a community in China going to make of um, the ritual prescriptions for having certain types of medicines that was composed in India, right? And often they would substitute local um, lo local medicines that were considered to be equivalents. And I'm, I'm sure that kind of thing was happening um, in the in the Khmer Empire as well with, with um, recipes from, you mentioned Shushruta or from uh, other other Indian texts, maybe um, not all of those substances were necessarily locally available, and so these kind of traditions of substitution would be established. Um, I, I don't know if if we know too much about the um, recipes that were being um, or the recipes that were being used in these um, arogya salas in in Cambodia, or some any of the ritual practices that went along with those. I, I'm I'm wondering if some of the panelists from panel one had any any thoughts comparing um, what you know about Khmer medicine with the kind of rituals that Colin was talking about in his presentation. Do do we know anything about what was done in these? Uh, Reti, Reti is the expert. Oh, Reti, we can't hear you. Uh, no, sorry, Mary. Uh, I, I give the floor to Dr. Chavati because he asked you know, look at a lot of that. Uh, my my works mostly is on the field work, but I have some forms and collecting from the you know, um local people living along the ancient road. So the using you know some organ from you know animal or a little bit strange. I don't know how to explain, but also you know in the there is some healer. A healing tradition, you know, for local people or and also for ritual as well. So, so maybe get uh, Dr. Chambrati. No, I have I have no answer. You know, I'm a historian of medicine. I have no uh, knowledge, just uh, some very shallow knowledge about medical anthropology. But I wonder if uh, Dr. Plon Pisset is still around as a participant. Uh, Pisset is a medical anthropologist in Cambodia. He may have some some insight to that. One, one thing that occurred to me when we were talking here is these, these rituals that I, the ritual that I was describing, the Mentrop ritual, it was a, a ritual done by the Bon religion, but it's common to all Tibetan lineages of Buddhism. So it's, you know, you find it in Nyigma, the Kagyu, uh, quite often we get these Mentrop rituals, but they are tantric rituals, so they rely on the Vajrayana form of Buddhism. Um, and, but, and, and they're also textually based. So, uh, my question would be, is there not textual evidence in Cambodia of similar kind of rituals? Yeah, well, that, that, that again is the absence of text in Cambodia. Mm -hmm. it, it's inscribed in a stone, a dedication stella for each hospital. Then we get uh, some history, the kingdom, the contents, the religious uh, projection of the idea but not the detail of what the experts were actually doing thereafter when the institution was founded. There are very, very few indications. Those things are lost. Presumably there was some library in each hospital which would have uh, told us everything, or answered all your questions fully, but the, uh, the, the, the texts have, have, have evaporated. But I think what is interesting is uh, uh, with this meeting, uh, this, this meeting of minds from across Asia is that as the archaeology goes on in Cambodia into an extraordinary state level system for health, um, that you're, you're supplying things that the archaeologists can start looking for. Can we see a, a pattern which relates to um, what happens in Tibet and Nepal and China? Um, I think that's what's, uh, that's what's fascinating about this uh, meeting, 
of minds, that we're coming out of silos, which Pierce talked about within the subject, and, and that the, the cross-fertilization um, of practices that were human practices over a huge area, and which built into a, a huge pharmacolo pharmacological industry, were there too in Cambodia. And the, 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 we, we can build a pattern of things to go looking for as the archaeology progresses. There's one, well, there's one point, aspect. Point. Yeah, there, there's one aspect that I I know is that this medical knowledge from the healer I, are kept secret. You know, it's an oral tradition, transmission of knowledge from father to son or mother to daughter to son. Is that and also I, I've seen I observe that if you disclose the source of knowledge, that medical uh, uh, skill, you know, uh, loses. It's magic also. There's a lot of things there. So it's not just the lack of text, it's that the practice, uh, the magic and the uh, uh, secrecy of the practice uh, may mm -hmm. play a role in that absence of a uh, of a obvious knowledge for, for researchers, you know, obvious sources for researchers. Just uh two things uh real quick to add to those comments and uh, very important to know. Uh and thank you for bringing them up, um, both the previous uh inputs is one i mean you're talking about an area at least with the clove of nutmeg that's endemic to east indonesia about three thousand kilometers east of cambodia you know new guinea to central asia and the Middle east region and these networks are long in existence and the earliest reference to clove in the Middle east is turk about three and a half thousand years ago although it's questionable if that's if that's true or not but certainly uh clove and nutmeg were circulating from uh, the Han Dynasty onwards uh, in, in semi-global uh, connections. Um, the other thing is that from an anthropological perspective, the whole concept of magic, secrets, mm. spiritual empowerment, otherworldly empowerment to both the plants, to foreign origin, exotic origins, all this stuff gives it power. And whether that has a psychosomatic effect, uh, whether it has a you know, other uh, spiritual impacts and things like that is, is critically important. That occurs in almost all cultures and keeping the secret, keeping the magic, having it inherited. And so it's not specific to one society. It's uh, actually pretty pan-human and pan-cultural in many regards. Uh, specific manifestations are culturally distinct, of course. But, uh, you know, that has a huge impact on how it's prepared, the rituals involved in the and how it's implemented and uh, how it's, you know, the spoken word is just as powerful in the, in the context of maybe being even uh, uh, possessed during uh, certain practices and things like that, or at least in contact with the spiritual world, so to speak. And so this has, you know, whether it's a placebo effect or uh, psychosomatic or anything like that, you know, it becomes clearly important. And it's also a great way to uh, heuristically kind of uh, rules of thumbs, uh, uh, keep the knowledge and simplify it so it can be passed along. And I think those are very important points. Thank you for bringing them up, both of you. So um, we've, we've turned the Q&A, the 10 minute Q&A into uh, a 20 minute Q&A plus um, <laughs> cross panel. Okay. Fertiliz cross fertilization between the panels. Um, so I, I, I think, and we're up on the hour. So I, I want to turn this back over to Peter just to close this, close our, um, our 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 webinar here. I just wanted to say though on the on the point that um, we that Peter that you last made the the cross pollination and trans regional sort of networks that we've been talking about historically, I think are very much paralleled by the the cross pollination and the collaborations that we have right here within this webinar. So I wanted to just thank you for bringing all of us together from around the world to discuss this topic and uh, to get to meet colleagues that I haven't met before from Cambodia. So um, very, very happy and uh, um, grateful that you've uh, put this together, Peter. So thank you to everybody. And uh, well, I want to thank everybody. It's been, uh, it's been a, a real eye opener for me. And I think for a good many of you, uh, when we find expertise in areas that we only know uh, fringes of. Um, the purpose of this was to place the, the extraordinary Cambodian con 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 contribution into the history, because uh, it's not really got its proper place. And 
it was an extraordinary um, state effort. And the effort, lots of evidence is there. It was massive. And so it was an institutional way of bringing in the religion, the pharmacology, uh, the herbs, everything that was necessary, the rituals, bringing the, all, all these people together. And I think if, if we can um, go forward in forming a, uh, a Cambodia-focused um, effort later this year, uh, with all this abundance of expertise on the subject of uh, medieval medicine in Asia, then I think um, it's got a very promising future. I think we're, I, I feel that we're at the beginning of the cross-pollination and the really understanding of uh, what an achievement it was by this king in the 12th century to institutionalize all of this. Very few have done that. And uh, I think that I, I, the ambition of Reti and myself is to, is to put that Cambodian piece into the, into the basement of uh, this large and important study for humanity. So thanks to everyone again. We're hoping that we can arrange a visit that uh, Reti will help us with, where we can come and meet the Apsara colleagues. Um, let me thank especially Meng Hong and Pierce for um, dealing with experts with far too much expertise to transmit in, in a Pekka Kucha uh, uh, format. But uh, it's, got, it's got real value, this Japanese approach. And I think we have all managed to scoop some really interesting stuff um, from the surface of people's deep studies. So thanks again to. Um, Center for Southeast Asian Studies. Thanks for Charles for uh, steering us through this. The internet has, uh, has, has served as well. Thank you also to Tineka Waters, and I hope that we can meet uh, the, the, the current medical uh, experts in, in Phnom Penh if we can get this trip organized um, later this year. Anyway, very nice start to the year. Promise of lots of collaboration and expansion in our work and breaking through barriers to meet each other. I think um, it's been a brilliant idea. This was really Reti's idea. So thank you again, Reti. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks Looking forward much. to seeing you all in Cambodia in the future. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Stay safe. Yeah. Bye. 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 Yeah. Bye, Michelle. Bye, Steve. Bye. Bye, Kai. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. And I'd like to thank all the organizers and people behind the scenes because uh, brilliantly executed and thanks for all the preparation. And especially thanks to the Cambodians uh, centerpiece of the, all this. It, without you, it wouldn't have happened. And thank you.